Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Live special number 157, recorded May 15th, 2013. Google I.O. 2013. Twit Live's breaking news coverage of Google I.O. is brought to you by Slingbox. Hi, I'm Tom Merritt. Welcome to our Twit special coverage of the Google I.O. announcement, where we expect to hear no product announcements. Or at least that's, <laughs> that's what Sundar Pichai <laughs> said. Joining us, of course, Ayaz Akhtar. Uh, thank you for being along with us today from Tech News Today and Know How. Also, Sarah Lane of iPad Today, i5 for the iPhone, and of course, Tech News Today. And our guest, Aaron Newcomb, uh, who you often mm -hmm. see on Floss Weekly, has a brand new job. Welcome, Aaron. Yeah, thanks for having me. So it looks like they're actually crawling up on stage at, uh, I don't know if they're crawling. They may be walking, but they're, they're starting to get things going. The stream has started. Uh, we've got a countdown, and there it is. Uh, the folks at Google I.O. Leo Laporte's in there. Gina Trapani's in there. Jeff Jarvis is in there. We'll be keeping tabs on them from the IRC chat room as the announcements happen. Uh, what are you guys uh, excited to hear about? I know we had a lot of leaks before this thing started. I think the thing I'm excited about is the thing I've actually seen was the Google Maps leak so far. It, it uh, The new services that are being integrated, including the flight search to me, I thought that was intriguing. This idea of combining your uh, the different modes of transportation, I thought that was a great idea because Google's had all of these these uh, you, these products for travel, but they haven't put it all together. And it looks like Google Earth's also coming up to Maps. It seems like a great uh, unification of all of that. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I think for me, it's probably the... The music service. Um, I'd like to hear the details of, you know, how Google plans to uh, take on a, a company like Spotify that obviously has many, many thousands of users in a variety of countries and 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 has a service that works for a lot of folks. But that again, if Google can get people to convert over and use Google's other products, um, you know, we talked about this on TNT earlier this morning, as I has mentioned, using Google Plus to be able to share music with friends. Uh, which is, you know, a social network that's already built in. Google wouldn't really have to build something separate for music. That's that's that sounds pretty fun to me. Looks yeah. like Vic Condotra is on stage now. Yeah, we're still seeing the, uh, yeah, the, still the intro video in the feed. They're showing Pong being played with the, the developer's code. They're showing off, yeah, Chrome, how, how powerful it can be with the dancing All Android. All right, so we're, Ooh. I mean, it looks like we're at least a good 30 seconds behind... So I'll just uh, I'll just wrap Sarah. up real quick while we're uh, for my predictions while we're waiting. Um, I, I think unification is going to be the key with Babel and uh, Maps and things like that. It looks like we're about ready to start. But six thousand people in the audience at Google I/O. Well, good morning and hello, and on behalf of Google, let me extend our warmest welcome to the 6,000 of you here in attendance, as well as the over 40,000 who've joined us in 440 viewing parties across 90 countries worldwide, and to the over 1 million who are watching live on YouTube right now. Welcome to the sixth annual Google I.O. So some people were wondering if Sundar Pichai would host now that he runs both Chrome and Android, but of course, they're not gonna you take know, that away from Vic. Our platform and services teams have worked incredibly hard to get to this point, and I hope you're going to be delighted by some of the surprises we have in store for you this morning. But as that opening video showed, it's really not about us. It's about you, developers, who are building the most amazing and magical experiences that make those platforms and service come alive. So when we say thank you, we really sincerely your support, your enthusiasm, your building of apps for our platform and services um, has been deeply appreciated. 
And we hope so, that the you know what, Alex, go ahead and, and, and refresh that page. Let's see if we can get it a little closer, because Sundar Pichai is already on stage now, and it seems to be drifting farther and farther behind. I know it's always risky to do this. We do have the live blogs uh, behind us. Can we just do that throughout the whole presentation, just speed it up like that? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's incredibly exciting to be here. Uh, welcome to Google I.O. I think we are in the middle of one of the most pivotal moments in personal computing. Uh, we're going through one of the most innovative phases in personal computing. Most of you in this audience have lived through the PC revolution, an incredibly important revolution in our lifetime. It started around 1980, but if you take a look back for over 25 years, most people in the world used one operating system, which was Windows. And in terms of hardware form factors, it evolved from desktops to laptops. And now everybody uses it. a long period of time. But fast forward to about seven years ago, with the advent of smartphone, there's been an explosion of devices, phones and tablets, and increasingly newer types of devices. I would love for them to say they're People integrating Chrome and Android right now. These devices at an amazing pace. Just right off the top. A profound yeah. impact on their it's data. about an explosion. Nothing captures this moment. That'd be an implosion. That's the picture behind me. Yeah, I guess right. <laughs> These are two pictures in the same location in St. Peter's Basilica. The one on the left is the funeral of Pope John Paul II. This is the a very popular right picture, is uh, in Harrison, of isn't it? The new Pope, yep. Francis, recently. For sure, different moments. The one on the left is more somber, but you can see there is one person way ahead of their time with a clamshell phone trying to take a picture. But you look at the one on the right, a sea of phones capturing that moment. Disrespectful. Mm -hmm. The world has changed pretty dramatically just in a span of six to seven years. Increasingly, people are using many, many different types of computing devices. It's not just desktops, phones, and laptops anymore. It's watch with displays. It's thermostats with displays. Maybe your car or console has a display and maybe something like Google Glass. When you look at all these computing devices, it's a multi-screen world. These are all smart displays with a lot of computing power in them. In addition to that, they have sensors. They can listen, they can feel, they can hear, and the amount of computing power in these screens is incredible. It's a little ominous, actually. And usable. Mm -hmm. And users are really adopting these computing devices. We at Google, are incredibly excited. This is why we view this as one of the most important moments in computing, and we are working very, very hard to continue this journey forward. They should have the photoshopped is, everyone with Google Glass on. Is the impact we can have on people around the world. That's what, people will see. That's what this journey of personal computing is about for us. We are very, very fortunate at Google to have two platforms, two large open platforms, two fast-growing platforms, to scalable platforms completely designed for developers like you to build amazing experiences. Fortunate is one Android word for that. And Chrome. Android started with the simple goal of bringing open standards to the mobile industry. Today, it is the most popular mobile operating system in the world. Yay. Why does that need applause? Okay. Because Android's Chrome, awesome. So you can get free stuff. Again, oh, let them clap. Make the web <laughs> much better, both as a platform for developers and as an experience for users. The goal was to design a simpler, safer, and faster browser. And today, it is the most popular browser used in the world. I was going to say, you better applaud that. Android and Chrome, as I said earlier, are really designed for people to build amazing experiences on top. We at Google are working hard on top of these platforms. We call this the best of Google. We are building products like Search, Maps, YouTube, Google Now, and many more new things which you will hear about later. Many more new things which you will hear about later today. So we are working hard on top of these platforms to push the journey of computing forward. But what really excites us is that developers like you can build thousands of third-party applications, great applications which really make a difference on top of Android and Chrome. And that's what a lot of this keynote is about. What are we doing on top of these platforms so that you can continue doing the great work 
Yes. And this is what Pichai said that, in the Wired interview with Steve started, Levy, is we're going to be talk talking to developers in this announcement. So if you're looking for consumer so end stuff, you may ago, be disappointed. We announced we had over 100 million activations of Android. We were incredibly excited at the rate of the growth. And a year ago at Moscow, we celebrated the fact that we have over 400 million activations of Android. The momentum has been breathtaking since then. So let's take a look at where we are. Could have just told us. No, but even <laughs> snazzy CG Android to tell us. Maybe that was the Android getting activated. Yeah, that was the very first Android activation. Not a lot of people know about that, really. <laughs> Ooh, this looks like ingress to me. This looks like the default wallpaper of Honeycomb to me. It's like, what's going on here? And ladies and gentlemen, it's not that we don't like Android. It's that we don't like presentations. We're mocking presentations. That's true. Listen to the audio. Everything is fine. That's just the noise that they're playing at Google. Yeah. I like, like this vector graphics, though. It's not bad. Yeah, it's kind of cool, actually. They should just pull back. I got some Chrome right now. It's like, yeah, we're running this in Chrome. This is a little bit un-Oracle-like. What do you guys think? I mean, sorry, un-Google-like. <laughs> That's what I was like. It's I more think like Oracle. You're right. It's, it's kind it's, of you're, Yeah, it's more like, I was going to say, it seems more like an Oracle. 900 million. It's an extraordinary achievement, but it's an extraordinary ecosystem achievement. We couldn't have gotten there without the help of a lot of you in the audience and people around the world, developers around the world. We're incredibly humbled by where we have reached, but we have to remember there are over 7 billion people on this planet. So we have a long way to go, and we think the journey is just getting started. So if you look, uh, we're going to put a map of the world. Verge points out Sundar's you wearing a pebble watch. Areas of the world mm. where the penetration of Android is less than 10%. And as you can see, while we are growing very, very fast, most of the world, the countries in green here represent over four and a half billion people, and the penetration of Android is less than 10%, but it is growing very, very fast. So a lot of this journey is about bringing that next four and a half billion people online and making a difference in their lives. So we're going to talk a lot about what we are doing in Android, both for developers and users to continue this momentum. And to get started, I'm going to invite Hugo onto the stage. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sundar. How are you guys doing this morning? All right. He's the happiest uh, man in Google. You guys just I heard think. about ha. the spectacular Android ecosystem momentum all around the world. Well, it's also been an amazing year for Android developers. He goes the boss. Here's a pretty insane <laughs> number for you. <laughs> Google you Play Off. has just crossed 48 billion app installs. That's right, 48 billion app installs. That's a huge number. And two and a half, thank you. And two and a half billion installs in the last you see month Duarte alone. There, but even you better than that, audience. over the last Four months this year, we've already paid out Taking more pictures money with an interesting looking Android device. developers on Google Play than in all of last year. And revenue per user, thank you. He's just gonna say thank you until they applaud. And revenue per user, <laughs> which is a pretty important stat for all of us, is two and a half times what it was just a year ago, globally. So, you guys, Android developers, are really the heart of this ecosystem, and I think you know that. We've been in this incredible journey together for over five years now, since the first Android SDK came out. And as Vic said, Google I.O. is all about you. And we're here to show that we're listening. And we're here because we really want you to thrive. So let's go. Let's get started. You go wearing an analog watch. The first thing we want to do is give you a preview of some exciting developer tools and services that we're announcing here at I.O. And of course, you'll get to see these in great detail in the 52 Android sessions and code labs that we've put together uh, just for you over the next three days. Let's see if they emphasize security right. here. So first off is 
Google Play Services. A few months ago, we launched Google Play Services as a layer built and managed by Google on top of the Android platform. It includes APIs that we at Google use to build our own apps, like Google Maps uh, and Google Now. And we're making these APIs available to you so that you can make your apps even better. Um, Google Play services are distributed via the Play Store, and it's automatically update, updated directly by Google, independently of operating system versions. This means you have access to the latest APIs consistently on all devices. Thank you. Now, one of the first APIs that we launched as part of Google Play services was the Google Maps Android API V2. It's probably going to uh, be the Google you Maps in your apps. Uh, You're looking here at the Expedia app. And you can Made see this is a leaky. major user experience upgrade compared to the original Android platform Maps API. It allows you to build Google Maps directly into your app. Amazing vector-based maps, full 3D movement and rotation, and 3D building profiles. Uh, looks really, really great. Now, location is a key input to so many apps. Uh, the Google Maps API is, of course, a huge part of this. But today, we're going to take it one step further by launching three new location APIs uh, as part of Google services. The first API is called Fused Location Provider. We've completely rewritten our location algorithms, taking advantage of all the sensors. Um, so that location is now faster to acquire, it's more accurate, and we're also adding a new low power location mode that uses less than 1% of battery per hour. It's nice to be tracked all day. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and use less power. That's true. It's more greener tracking ability. Leo was saying in the chat room, you're going to see a lot of Google Glass on people's heads out there in the, uh, in the audience. The new location yeah. API that we're announcing today, geographic areas. And those trigger when the user enters or exits uh, these areas. You can have up to 100 geofences simultaneously active per app. This has been a big ask from you guys. There you go. That's what I thought. So I thought you would like that. The third new location API that we're announcing today is activity recognition. There's been a lot of interest from the developer community for apps that help users track their physical activities. Uh, this new API, um, Activity Recognition, uses accelerometer data and machine learning, classifier, machine learning classifiers to automatically figure out when the user is walking, uh, cycling, or driving. That's and cool. we do it in a really battery efficient way without even turning on the GPS. Um, so we think there's going to be a whole new category of awesome apps that take advantage of this new capability. It can also open up a whole new class of hardware as well, running yeah, exactly. Android, because you yeah. can have mm -hmm. Android running on your wrist if you Wearable want. So technology. Well, and, and the difference Another between Google walking, driving, and, and, and bike rec Google. directions Google is one of the big advantages giant. Google Maps has. Maybe yeah. I mean, how do they know the difference between biking and driving if you're driving slowly? You don't have to you know? Maybe it's all speed-based, right? And users don't have or if you bike really fast, like you do, Sarah. <laughs> so theoretically, that's what I'm saying. If it's, you know, if it's looking, if it's cross, uh, if it's taking all the Google data you've done that day. Let's say you did a search for directions, or you're looking up uh, workouts, and you looked up bicycling. Maybe it's figuring that out, kind of contextualizing everything you've done, kind of Google Nowy. I bet that would yeah. kind of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like what time of day you usually commute, so you're yeah. in your car type thing. Into Google. You know, we had this guy on All About Android that was wondering how to detect when his uh, washing machine was was done with the load, when it was done. Maybe this would help him. Now, here's the interesting part. <laughs> he wanted to set the phone on top of his washing machine and detect when the washing machine was done. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to do it. It's pretty cool because now you have to remember in washing machines. So they're talking about uh, cross-platform <laughs> sign-in with Google Plus. Uh, when when you sign on, you get prompted to automatically install the Android app on your tablet and phone through Play. Now, Jay should have gotten the notification. There it is. Uh, that says. The app was automatically installed on his tablet. This actually just happened. And we, thank you. And when he opens uh, the app here, because he's already signed in on the Fancy website, he's automatically logged into the Fancy on his Android tablet. Isn't that cool? That is the website Fancy. He's not just saying. <laughs> so if he goes to my the My Collection section, which shows things that he's fancied before, there it is. That's your margarita machine, Jay. 
That's pretty cool. So that's cross-platform single sign-on in action. Nice little plug for the right. fancy. Yeah, yeah, right. So they said they're moving that over to Google Play. I mean, everything up to now has really so been tied to going, Gmail. Uh, with Google Play services. Um, last year at I.O., we Google announced Plus. Google, Plus, Cloud Google Plus, or GCM Sorry. for short. Um, GCM is a service that's managed by Google that lets you seamlessly push data from your servers to your Android apps. Um, GCM was super well received by the entire developer community. 60% of the top 100 apps in Play Store today are using GCM. And Leo points out the chat room that's not new, the sign on, they're just highlighting. GCM push messages every second. That's 17 billion messages a day. And it's the cross device thing. And what's even, what's even more impressive is the average server to server, server, to server latency. That's 60 milliseconds, which is actually 30% faster than when we launched the service just a year ago. Um, so the news here today is that GCM is now part of Google Play services. And we're announcing three major new features as part of a major upgrade. So first, GCM now supports persistent connections between your servers and Google. With a persistent connection, you can send a large number of messages to many, many devices very quickly. Thank you. Second, uh, we're launching one of the GCM features that you have requested the most. And I think you'll like this. Upstream messaging, there you go. You can now use GCM to send data in the other direction as well. So from your app to your servers, just as seamlessly. Uh, GCM, of course, does all the client-side connection management for you. It automatically retries uh, if the network isn't up and so on. So it really helps to keep battery and data usage as minimal as possible. Third, and I'm sure you'll love this one too, uh, we're launching another GCM API that synchronizes notifications for you. So that when nah. you dismiss a notification Thank on one device, yeah. yes. there you go. You have multiple Android devices, you know that this is ridiculous. So that same notification goes machine. away uh, on the other device as well. And you'll see more about this here today. I'm telling you, it's all about unification. Uh, all of the three new major DCM features you saw are rolling out progressively. And all you have to do is sign up, uh, to, and you can do that starting today. So to summarize, this is where we are right now. These are the Google Play services we've covered already. Uh, the Maps API. Um, the, the new location APIs, Google Plus sign-in with cross-platform single sign-on, and GCM with upstream messaging and synchronized notifications. Well, I hope they now, we're gonna implement this first for service, um, Google Plus. One that we're adding you guys today. have that problem? Like you go to Gmail well, and you've got like a bunch of gaming. notifications and you go to Gmail. Yeah. Well, hopefully they can and do that. And then your phone, you've got a bunch of notifications. All around the world, games are doing better than ever. And today we're announcing a new family of APIs built specifically for game developers. We call it Google Play Game Services. So let's talk about that. Yeah, and call it frugal, like I The thought. first <laughs> new Google Play Game yeah, Services the API is Cloud Save. Uh, Cloud Save enables you to save user data across devices like player progression and game state. So if a player uh, finishes playing level one uh, on his phone, for example, he can then pick up his Android tablet Yay. and start playing right away. More yeah, unification. Too. Yes. This is stuff that's like awesome. whisper sync for gaming. Yeah, that's that's cool. Uh, my kids, my, it just drives my kids nuts when they play like leaderboards. a game uh, on my phone and then they want to go to my wife's tablet and they've got to start it, all over. Uh, really easy for you to increase engagement inside of your games. And leaderboards use Google Plus circles to Of course, everyone knows I don't play games. And really so. encourage friendly competition. Let's Much too productive way. for that. Um, so here we are in the world, right. in the, the game called The World of Goo. And from within the game, game. Uh, my friend Jay can launch into a leaderboard and see how he ranks against other players. So here in the public leaderboards, you can see that he's actually not very highly ranked. You can't even find him. Uh, that's the public <laughs> leaderboard. But that's okay. So we're going to mock him publicly. Because he's that. number two amongst his friends on Google+, which looks pretty cool, until, of course, you see who's number one. Um, <laughs> now, uh, Cloud Save. Uh, achievements and leaderboards um, are APIs that we're launching not only on Android, but also for iOS and web, so you can have cross-platform gaming experiences, which I think is pretty important. iOS. That's intriguing. Uh, now, here's where it gets really exciting. The next Google Play 
games, uh, game services API that we're announcing today is a comprehensive multiplayer service for matching players and engage them in head-to-head -head competition. Mm. We know, obviously, because you tell us that building low latency, real-time synchronous games is pretty damn hard. So we want to help. So the first thing we'll do is we're going to deal with all the hard networking problems and manage all of the device peer-to-peer -peer connections for you. And then the second thing we'll do via Google Plus is make it easy for your players to invite friends that they want to play with or against, as well as quickly find new people that they can challenge. Can you do that from iOS too? So this up here is a sneak or preview two of Riptide 2 by Vector Unit. It uses the new multiplayer uh, gaming service, and it's an awesome jet ski racing game that's launching this summer. Uh, we have uh, Miles, Jay, and Catherine in decreasing order of height here on stage. Uh, and we're going to get a little competitive. Background so looks Jay's like going to invite Catherine and Miles like uh, one of the levels from Wave for Race. a head-to-head -head race here. Uh, and he does that right inside the game, as you saw. Uh, now let's bring up the tablets, the other two tablets on screen. So Catherine and Miles are actually already in the app. Um, and let's see, it looks like uh, they received Jay's invite, so they'll accept that. Of course, if they were not in the app, they'll get notified, and they can then go into the game that way. Matt uh, 3 so, points out, uh, oh yeah, it doesn't use started, Google Play uh, services. I wonder if this would change that. Up by the Play Game Down. server, uh, and hopefully in a second here, um, uh, we'll start playing. But I think it's really up to the developer, right? So right. it would be the game developer that would choose to use these new services, the Google Play services, right? Um, well, would Ouya have to implement it on the Android level, though, Jay. or no? Well, Ouya runs Android already, and I, right. and I don't think I don't oh. think it requires some sort of underlying service to be running okay, in yeah, order to support this. Okay, I think we're good now. Are we? Yeah. This is not the most networking friendly room, is it? So this would allow you to play okay. anybody on any you device, really. So if I had a phone and, and uh, Aaron, you had an Ouya. Let's, let's give it a one. Jason right. had a tablet. Let's give it a We'll all play against each other. As long as it was things. using the service mm -hmm. in the background. Yeah. Because they have an advantage. It's like, you're using a real controller. Right. Right, yeah. Using a tablet. Geeks, <laughs> three jet skis, a bunch of play games APIs. Now they've got it possibly go wrong. Well, half hour in and, you know, our first demo problems. It's not too bad. Well, they did schedule three hours. Yeah. This is probably part of it. Uh -oh. They see. put um, in some padding for demo fail. They're buffering. Also, the leaderboard interface looks very, that, very familiar with uh, Google's new oh, UI go. look. The cards interface. I great. think we're good now. Yeah, leaderboards is okay. It's a good feature to have, I guess. But you know, it's not. You need, it's join. good for Android, right? But I mean, obviously, Steam and and other platforms have had this for forever. So it's, it's good Leo that they're catching up. He's not on the Wi-Fi. There. Do you want to show off fault. your skills as uh, maybe a single player? <laughs> No? All right. That's fine. Well, uh, too bad, because this, this is actually a really exciting demo. Uh, like I said, the networking environment here isn't the most friendly, uh, but you'll get to see this uh, not only uh, uh, later today, but through the next three days. We've got sessions. Uh, three days of buffering. Out. So um, marketing people take note well, when you're doing uh, a presentation like this. Always have a backup uh, video ready about, to play. Uh, some other things. Uh, uh, what you'll like see here are some of the developers that we've been when working on. When you're doing a big presentation, uh, have a video ready uh, in case the demo doesn't work. Into their titles. Especially if you're uh, using wireless lots networking. Of games. Yeah launching today with many of these capabilities that we talked about. Um, now, <coughs> these game APIs that we just talked about are also part of Google Play services, um, by the way. And all the core APIs that you see here, some of the things that we talked about today, uh, will be available via an update to Google Play services that we're rolling out today to all Android devices for you and up. And we'll continue to add the best of Google innovation so that you can continue to build um, Awesome apps. Now, he was not as happy as he was when he started the presentation. <laughs> no. I want to shift gears and talk about developer tools. One of the most common pieces of feedback uh, that we get from you all the time is that you want more options for Android development. Well, today we want to show you a new Android tool that we've been working on. It's called Android Studio. And it's based on the community edition of IntelliJ from JetBrains, which obviously you guys know very well. Wow, this is a hit. Uh, Android Studio is an IDE that's truly built for Android with the goal of making you faster and much more productive as an app developer. Yeah, it's a Java IDE. I'd like to show you this live. And Popular to do that, Java here's IDE. Thor Norby 
from the Android Tools team for a quick demo. Take it over. Good morning. Today I want to share with you a few of my favorite features in Android Studio. As Hugo said, Android Studio is based on IntelliJ, so it's a fully featured IDE right from the get-go. What I love about it is the attention to detail, which makes it a pleasure to use. The IDE has a deep semantic model of your code, and it understands Android, so that makes the code editor smarter and more productive. Take, for example, this code right here. This is how you write internationalized apps in Android. You don't hard code your strings, you look them up from resource files. Well, this IDE can figure out what the real strings are and show them to you in place in the editor as if you had hard coded the string. So note that the code is still there, it's just easier to, to read. And uh, we don't just preview strings. On the next few lines, you can see that I'm manipulating some icons, and those icons are previewed right here in the editor margin. Oh, that's pretty cool. Mm. And so likewise, here's a color file, and you can see that we resolve the colors and preview those in the editor margin as well. Wow. See, now Tom thought this wouldn't talk about end users. Clearly. This is <laughs> now, when you're editing your layouts, you now yeah, get a live rendering of what the layout is going to look totally like in runtime. Totally totally yeah. This yeah. is this, what makes this, this really crazy. powerful. This is really cool. Is that we have multi-configuration editing. So what if I want to know what this layout looks like on different screen sizes? Let's take a look. So here it is. I mean, none of this is stuff you couldn't do, but it's so conveniently laid out. Right. Well, my question is, they said it's based on the community so version of IntelliJ, which is open source. I'm just wondering if they forked the project. And everything in between. Because they're calling it Google, they calling it Google Studio or Android, Android Studio. So I wonder if they forked the project or if it's a plug-in to the community edition. So if we jump into the settings layout for our app. Leo says Gina's excited. I can now take a look at the languages we're You excited, Aaron? I am. This and is so really cool. Here I I, I'm just curious whether it's a fork or not. I'd, I'd rather have them contribute so code back to I can see the community the version of IntelliJ board, for than to fork the project. But so let's say I want to make an edit. Let's say we I want don't to know that the they're font size. The no, we don't yet. That's, but I'm really curious. I can do that. And that's obviously too big. So let me go back a little and make it 26. So now this looks OK in English. But notice that in German, right next to it, right over here, the string is actually uh, wrapping, which that's I don't so want. That's so awesome. So at this point, I could either continue tweaking my layout or get a shorter translation, if that's possible. So in short, this is a feature that makes it really easy to ensure that your layouts work well across a variety of devices and configurations. And while I focus on the code editor today, this also works in the full UI builder. We have big plans for Android Studio. We plan to integrate more and more services into the IDE. For example, with the simple menu item, I can add a Google Cloud messaging backend into my app. And then I can take advantage of all those great GCM APIs that Hugo told you about earlier. And this is just scratching the surface of all the new features in Android Studio. Thank you. Leo pointed out it's Google Wave for developers. The chat room was wondering about the license for IntelliJ. All it right. is the Apache 2.0 uh, license. I think I actually lost my prompter, guys. I needed somebody to advance that manually for me. Uh-oh. If we could do that. Hugo's off the reservation. <laughs> uh, Surprised they're not doing their presentation uh, the with Google Glass on their face. Yeah, exactly. Why not? Okay. Headaches. Well, then we well, can well. have it. <laughs> so, of course, Distracting, uh, I guess. half of the game is about building awesome apps, uh, developer tools. Well, at least they're not trying to so launch on. the demos the from other Google Glass. Uh, is about distribution and just monetization. Just going to swipe now. How do you find more swipe, users? Swipe, How do you swipe. monetize your app? To tell you about uh, a bunch of new features to the Android developer console. I'd like to invite on stage uh, Ellie Powers from the Android product team. Ellie, come on up. You know, I, I really respect the fact that this is a developer right. keynote. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Not a press I'm Ellie, and this is Miles. So last year at Google I.O., we announced the new Google Play Developer Console. And since then, you've sent us tons of feedback telling us exactly what you want to see next. We've taken that feedback into account, and today I'm here to tell you about five new features that we're adding to the Developer Console to help you get more users and make more money on Android. So let's get started. The first feature I want to tell you about is optimization tips. So let's take a look here. We can see all of my apps in the developer console. And let's take a look at Fortune Teller, which is my most popular app. OK, here we go. 
This app is doing pretty well, but I'm always wondering, what can I do to make Fortune Teller a bit more successful? And that's exactly what we had in mind with Optimization Tips. It analyzes your app, we look at how your app is doing in the, we look at how your app is doing in the Play Store, and we offer you insights about how you can improve it. So what do we have today? We have two optimization tips. The first one is telling us that we should design our app for tablets by uploading tablet screenshots. Now this is really important. I should definitely do it because it will encourage more users on tablets to install my app. Next, it's telling me that I have a lot of users who speak Russian and they're already using my app, but my app isn't actually translated into, but my app isn't actually translated into Russian. So that's another opportunity for me. Okay, I don't speak Russian, so I need to get some help. It used to be a lot of work to find a translator for your apps. You had to search the internet looking for a good company. But we want to make this easier. So that's why today we're now going to use our new app translation service. Wow. Fantastic. Oh, that's cool. And we're announcing this today. This service allows you to get professional translations directly in the developer console, and we're going to try it out. Okay, it that takes just a minute to upload the string yeah, right? you want translated into the Google Play developer console here. Next, we select the languages that we want to translate into. So for today, we're of course going to select Russian to try to help those guys out. Next, it's going to show us a list of all the different translation vendors, and then I can just pick one that suits my budget. And that's it. Google will send my strings off to the translation company, and then in about a week, they come back, and I can download them directly from the developer console. Super simple. That is really convenient. Some of you may be interested in participating in this pilot program, so please sign up in the developer console today. Okay, now I've gotten Fortune Teller ready for the Only Russian market. Only pilots use the program. So I want to they invest in a different campaign languages. to yes, promote yes. my app. But naturally, I want to know which ads are the most effective. And that's why we're announcing referral tracking. This makes it easy to understand which ads are most effective, and we're going to switch to Google Analytics to take a look at it. Okay, here we're adding a new report in the acquisition section. This is a conversion funnel report with data from Google Play. It shows us where our installs come from, like blogs or top websites and other important ads. So here we go. This will allow us to track the effectiveness of each referral channel. So on the left, we have each of the channels, followed by how many users view, install, and launch our app. OK. Installations with an app are really just the first step. What you want is for users to come back to your app again and again. And I want to understand how often people are using my app. I can do that with Google Analytics, but I have to go to Google Analytics. So soon, we're going to be showing these great engagement metrics from Google Analytics directly in the developer console. You'll have all your metrics. Thank you. Yeah, that is good. That's more of the unification you've been talking right. about. Right. We want to give you all your metrics together. together in the same place. These two analytics features are rolling out later this summer. So now we have an app that people are launching all the time. So of course, it's time to make money. Like you, I just want to have simple tools to show me how much money I'm making every single day. So now, we've added a new tab to the developer console, giving us a summary of our app's revenue. You can see your global revenue and how it varies over time. And then we can even show country-specific revenue. For example, we can check how our app's doing in Japan. Wow, it looks like we had a great day last week. It must have been our new in-app products. Fantastic. So that's it. Revenue is at your fingertips, just like the rest of your metrics. OK. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we have a successful app. We're making lots of money. So now I'm ready to try some new features with my app. Now, it's important. I really want to find out what do my core users think about these new features before I roll them out to everybody. And from your feedback, I think a lot of you want to do this, too. So today, we are launching beta testing. Yeah, a lot of you talked to me on Google Plus about this one. And also staged rollouts. Let's take a look. OK, we now have three tabs in the developer console, alpha testing, beta testing, and production. We want to start with a small. All right, thank you. We'll start with a small group of alpha testers, 
and then roll out to a larger group of beta testers. Are the Let's cheers a lot louder okay. there than what we, we can hear? We select the APK Maybe, for our yeah. test. It must be. Next, we're going to use Google Groups and Google Plus communities to control access to the app. Keep in mind here, feedback will be sent directly to me, and it's not posted as public reviews. That's very important. OK, so now we have our new version. We're ready to put it into production. But rather than upgrading all my users in one go, I can now manage the rollout. So we can select a percentage here, like let's say 10%. You can do a little A-B And then we increase it over time when we're ready. OK. Don't all applaud at the same time. Let's start with 10% on this side. OK. So that was our five new features in the developer console. We had optimization tips. That's pretty cool. I mean, I think the, I think the thing that they're service, missing here still is better, um, referral tracking, a better way to graphs, get feedback and, and, and talk to actual users so that you can respond to users much more effectively when they have a complaint or this isn't working. I, I think that's a feature that they're still missing. But these all are right, really, really you. good features. These are great for developers. I've always been impressed Thanks, with how... Um, so just checking, how's everyone? The developer doing? console gives you all this information. You I've done a couple of small apps just to play with, and it's always okay. really impressive well, what you can get out of it. You, I'm, I'm not sure if um, the API Apple at the moment. App Store has the same well, kind of features. I guess it's probably but a good time to move on to something pretty cool. maybe a little bit more playful. And I think um, we're seeing the evidence of Larry Page's focus here. Yeah. Whose name yep. He's always it's not new players. features, it's much improved features. Although that's going to start to decline now that he can't talk. Can't tell people what to do anymore. Instead of rolling out new products, I mean, they've said, look, we've made the <laughs> products we have for morning, you developers yeah. work a lot Tokyo. better. Yeah, definitely. Up. All right. So uh, we've uh, just heard about some great APIs and tools to help you build the next wave of Android apps. But we've also been hard at work. Oh, I guess Gina Trapani confirmed that app uh, dev replies to users rolled out last night. So that's really cool. So never okay. mind. As never mind what heard. I said before. We've been successful. Ask and you shall receive. Over 48 yeah. billion applications installed from Google Play. But our aspirations Thanks, chat room for the heads up. than that. So I'm happy to talk to you today about some improvements we're making to Google Play. We recently launched a redesigned version of the Google Play Store. It has a simple, clean design that's designed to scale effortlessly across phones and tablets and the web. Let's take a look at the Play Store uh, on a Nexus 10 tablet. So here we have the store on the tablet. And uh, it's the same content that you would see on your phone or, or anywhere else, but it's uh, presented in a way that is much more richly uh, presented here on the tablet. Uh, the content's organized into collections. We have some uh, you know, movie suggestions What's up there, with this shirt? Does that mean the anything, the red, store, blue? It's just about looks. It's also designed to help you improve discovery of your app. Is that a logo? The Play Store home screen adapts to you. Or is it just Matrix something? reference? So here we see, yeah, that's what uh, I'm wondering. Is it the red uh, blue pill? Or he's saying Android is now both the red uh, and the blue pill? A book recommended uh, based on a previous book. Uh, You're good, uh, Aaron. recommended the movie Inception because uh, my buddy Adve plus one did. And uh, some music and apps recommendations as well. But to give you an idea of how this adapts to different people, uh, why don't we go out on a limb here a little bit and put Jay's tablet up uh, side by side so we can see the difference. And so here with Jay's tablet, you see he gets the same uh, types of recommendations. He's got uh, movies and music, et cetera, uh, because uh, his friends have plus one things or based on his previous uh, uh, apps that he's purchased, et cetera. But uh, one interesting thing that I didn't see until now is that uh, turns out you're a Metallica fan. All right, we should hang out. <laughs> All right, I think we've learned enough about Jay. Uh, so these personalization features are going to be rolling out over the coming weeks. But the point is that the new design of the Play Store gives us an excellent foundation for doing even more than what you've just seen. So we also know that many of you have invested a lot of energy in building awesome tablet experiences. And we want to assure that your work pays off and that users are able to discover your great tablet apps. So starting today, we're going to be providing a view on our top charts that surfaces ab applications that are designed for tablets. Now, this view here, thank you. Uh, it, this shows apps that meet our tablet app design guidelines. So they target tablet screen sizes, use a good uh, the screen real estate on the tablets effectively, et cetera. Uh, yeah, as an Nexus 7 as user, Ellie this is huge. showed you in the demo before, in the dev console, you can get hints about exactly what you should be doing here uh, if your app needs some specific treat, tweaks to meet this criteria. Uh, so I said that this UI scales across a variety of devices. So uh, why don't we show you how we're bringing this to uh, the rest of Play. Um, why don't we pop up uh, the laptop here. So over the coming weeks, 
We're going to be bringing the same great play experience to the web as well. You'll notice here that uh, it's the same consistent design. Uh, we have the same content here along with my personalized recommendations, but it's presented in a way that really takes great use of uh, the laptop. And uh, we also have a new navigation model here on the left-hand side that easily allows me to switch between apps, movies, music, and books. You know, in the run-through, we didn't put a picture of a more handsome man behind me up on the screen, but uh, I guess that's fine. Uh, so that's the Play Store. Uh, wow. But the, yes. the UX isn't just about the store. We also want to bring the same great uh, user experience to all of the Play apps themselves. So over the coming weeks, it's going to be rolling out to all the Play apps, books, movies, magazines, and of course, music. So you guys want to hear about music? Yes. Oh, I don't know. We're all just sitting there for nothing, so. Reuters and Bloomberg well. already told me everything. No matter who you are or where you're from, the joy of music is a constant. And with ubiquitous mobile devices, there's the potential to bring that music, bring that joy with us wherever we are. But when a bunch of us on the play team got together to talk about the next generation of our music service, uh, we all agreed that the reality was somewhat different. Yes, mobile devices uh, give us more choices than ever before, but they weren't we losing the audio on this music we loved. It felt more like work, right? Like when we were kids, he does seem quieter. Figuring out what or album to play was an event. It was a ritual. But so why is it that like managing my queue feels like a chore? So we set out to build a music service that didn't just give you access to a world of music, but also helped guide you through it. And we started from a great foundation. On this very stage two years ago, we launched our Locker service that allows you to upload 20,000 of your songs, stream them across all your Android devices and the web. I love Soon after, Google Music, by the we way. We launched our music store, Use deals it every day. from all the major labels and indies alike. And so today, users in 13 countries globally are enjoying their music on Play Music. But what if we gave you access to millions of tracks from our store in addition to your personal music library? And what if we combined the power of Google to understand what you want to hear and get you right to the music without any hassle. A music service that's about music and the technology fades to the background. We built that service. And today I'm happy to announce Google Play Music All Access, Yay. a uniquely Google approach to a subscription music service. All right, what's the twist? Do you guys use subscription you services now? Oh, yeah. Sarah does. Why don't we show it to them, anybody? Let's yet. pop it up on the phone. It's, I, I couldn't live without mine. All I access could. starts with Explore. It's the guided way for you to browse an entire collection of millions of tracks. And from the moment you enter Explore, we provide personalized recommendations based on your listening preferences. So here's some of my uh, personalized recommendations. We also have a section that we can swipe over to uh, that shows uh, featured content top albums and songs, as well as uh, playlists from our staff of music experts that's always fresh. Um, All right, so this is their if Spotify you guide thing. our assistance, um, we can swipe over and look into specific genres. So we have uh, 22 top-level genres with more to drill into. And uh, why don't we pick Alt Indie and go in there and show them what it looks like. So once we're in here, uh, you see expert-powered recommendations here, uh, playlists that are curated by our music editors, as well as top albums from the genre, and key albums that define the genre. But like everything in All Access, anything you see, you can immediately start playing. So Jay's uh, picked a track for us here. Jeff Jarvis says, and he's probably a little ahead of us, that all around him so people so are saying, so there good, goes Pandora. The magic stars, yeah. Because anything that I'm listening to in All Access, I can instantly turn into a radio Maybe. station. Maybe. I mean, it depends on... Free. So Android's still free, and they've got a lot of history into creating this music genome they talk about, right? I mean, right. they've been doing this for, what, Spotify and Radio also offer now, radio stations built around artists. Can swipe to take a so this isn't, new, you know, this isn't... We can tap on the playlist yeah, but I mean, do they have all the labels, all of the... The, um... And tailor it to our needs. So if there's something there we don't want to hear... The record companies signed up for this yet? I mean, you're, so you're only going to get recommendations for the stuff that they can stream. How much are you missing at this point? It's funny, they've, Google's effectively introduced a competitor to Xbox re Live you with can the, also the, yeah. the gaming thing. Yep. Now they're doing so Xbox Music. Yeah. So Microsoft's rules. had this stuff for a while, it right. says, and Google's going to probably run away with it. Yeah. yeah, they'll run away with it because they've got the... Thank you. The, exactly, they've got all the phones. 
All right. tablets are coming along. Sometimes so. you know exactly what you want to listen to, and we're Google, so there's always search at the top. Uh, so Here's right now I'm in the mood thing. for some James Blake. Uh, why don't you go ahead and light that up? And uh, so when uh, oh, I thought right. that was going to be James, James Blake Brown over there, that's great. Um, so w why don't we Ow. pop into the artist here? And when we do, we see a couple things that are interesting here about how All Access blends my catalog with all the millions of tracks available to you. So you see here that there's one album that I've previously uploaded uh, to the locker from James Blake. But if we scroll down, uh, we see the rest of his tracks and albums that are available to me in All Access blended together. And I notice uh, his most recent uh, album is available there. So why don't you go ahead and tap on that and add it to my library. So by adding it to my personal library, now it shows up here at the top. It's easy for me to access at all times. My library contains all my personal music that I uploaded, as well as anything that I've discovered and added from all access. But other times, I just want the music to start. I want to get to music with minimal effort. That's where Listen Now comes in. I just subscribed Listen to Pandora Now Pro. brings the power of Google <laughs> to surface music we know you're going to love. Should've There's waited. always a fresh set of choices in here. So in my uh, Listen Now view, you see the album I just added, as well as uh, some other uh, tracks that Yay, I played ben recently. Uh, there's also new releases from artists that uh, I enjoy. And you'll also see interspersed in here are radio stations that All Access has created for us automatically. With Listen Now, there's always a great selection of music available to me from my library and All Access. And every day, it surprises me. I can't wait for you all to have your own magic moments with Listen Now. So, so far, that's been All Access on the phone. Uh, but of course, it uh, works great on tablet and web browsers as well. So why don't we pop up the laptop? This is All Access uh, on the web browser. Uh, as you can see, it has the same great set of features. Listen Now is here with all my suggested content. Get me one click to music. I've got my library, radio, and of course, explore. And I can enjoy All Access, whether I'm on my laptop, on my tablet, or on my phone. 30-day so free to trial today, says Leo. All Access. Allows you to explore millions of tracks kind of effortlessly on any, any uh, device. Caching or Risk offline access. Millions of tracks yeah. effortlessly on any device. Radio without rules. Ten dollars a month. Completely interactive, if you so choose. Google-powered recommendations and one-click access to your music from Listen Now, and of course, the best of both worlds: your personal library blended with ours. That's all access. Now, there's a lot more I could show you. It's $120 a year. I want you all to try it yourself. So let's talk about how you can get it. All Access is priced at $9.99 a month in the US, but we're also giving everyone a 30-day free trial. That's perfect. And do I, I get a discount if I start the trial by June 30th? All, it's launching yeah. today in the US, and we'll be rolling out to additional countries soon. And if you start a trial by June 30th, you'll pay only $7.99 a month. Wow. That's awesome. It's like you read my mind. That 30-day free trial is key to this launch because That's they've got access. to get it's people using it, and hopefully they'll like it, right? I mean, that is, that is crucial. They had to do that. Because the, the price <laughs> isn't out of hand compared to an RDO or a Spotify, okay. but getting people to try it at that price yeah. might. Yeah. Yeah. They need to get people to switch. So many people are using other subscription services. I'll try it. A bunch of new tools For sure. and developer services that help you build awesome apps. Let's go ahead and reload the page again while he's in transition course, here. See if we can't catch up a little bit. Work. You also saw the new Google Play Store as well. No as disrespect, taste, Hugo. Uh, yeah, Hugo's in the recap. In case you missed the last 53 minutes, yeah. Hugo's yeah. going to explain what you slept through. <laughs> we know he's holding up a Samsung phone right now. But so far, uh, you know, the Google Play is the first big end user announcement that that people are really excited about. Yeah, Livestream is saying it could, this could be the S4 with stock. Yeah, he is holding up a GS4. Great new devices that are coming out from our partners, like, for example, the HTC One or the Samsung Galaxy S4, for example. In fact, um, there he goes. just like this one right here. Um, now, there's actually something a little bit different about this particular uh, uh, GS4. This particular you called Galaxy this, Aaron. S4 Confirmed. Something that is not available yet, but I want to show you anyways. So why don't you take a look at my home screen? Not available. But that would Can't be a privacy it. violation, Hugo. So what's that, the Nova launcher? <laughs> so that's my home screen. Uh, I've got my Google apps here in uh, my Google folder. If you scroll to the left, 
Uh, that's my music widget, uh, my calendar on the other screen. Um, go into notifications, you notice, pretty no clean notification with. shade. And quick settings, uh, also right at your fingertips. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys are getting this, right? That's Stock. awesome. Yeah, what you're seeing here is real. This is a Samsung Galaxy S4 running Android 4.2 Jelly Bean with the same software experience that we ship on our Nexus devices. It's Google's take on Android, and it feels really awesome on the Galaxy S4. Feels like the Windows signature line. In fact, it's the signature yeah. line. Right. This version of the Samsung unlocked, Galaxy too. S4 will be available directly through Google Play in the US. We're selling an unlocked model that works on both AT&T and T-Mobile with LTE support, 16 gigabytes of memory, expandable with an SD card, of course. Ooh. And also, so it says like June 26 for $649. Yeah, that's why I, that's why I said ooh. Yeah, $649. <laughs> yes. I caught the live stream first. System updates ooh. promptly with every Android platform update. So it's not a Nexus, but it's going to get updates like a Nexus. Right. And the S4 does give you expandability, which the Nexus this line doesn't. Of exactly. The Samsung Galaxy S4 uh, will be on sale starting on June 26 on Google Play for I can't $649. Wait June so that's what we have. <laughs> it is a spectacular device. Strange. There are T Mobile will sell that support. in their no uh, contract subsidized with way. With many of you over way. the next three days and seeing you all in the sessions. And with that, let me ask Sundar to come back to the Strange, stage. Strange, for their S4 presentation, they had no vignettes with dancing women and right, right. housewives yeah. and things. Broadway music playing. So we're moving into the Chrome part of the presentation. Does that mean we're done with Android stuff? We, we got an Android 4.3 announcement. Maybe they're saving that to the end. Yeah. This is actually the music that plays any time Sundar Pichai shows up. <laughs> uh, you can download this or add it in a Google Play Instagram. Yeah, this, this might not be available on all access. <laughs> yeah, Verge saying he comes out and says, we're going to switch from Android and talk about our other important platform. They, that doesn't mean they're done. They may be. Saving a little for the end. We've got two more hours it's on the schedule. We're going to switch from Android to talk about our other important platform, another open platform. Google Wave. Chrome. Oh. <laughs> As I said earlier, Chrome started with the goal to help make the web better, both as a platform and as an experience for users. It's been an incredible journey. Uh, we've had amazing adoption from our users. And last year, at Google I.O., we had reached 450 million, over 450 million monthly active users. We had reported weekly users before, but we are switching to monthly to be consistent with the rest of this presentation and industry metrics. Since then, we've had amazing momentum, and we have added over 300 million new users just in the last 12 months alone. And so today, we are at over 750 million. Wait, no vector graphics for Chrome? Oh. It's fact, it's just very flat. Chrome. So this is a browser he's talking about, is being right? used on mobile. What excites us is a lot of this new growth is coming on phones and tablets. We launched Chrome both for Android and iOS, and we are just beginning to start the pushing the mobile the web forward. A lot of what you hear OS, today is about how we can push the mobile web forward. Yet, but it is in its early days, path forward. but we think we can do to the mobile web what we did for the desktop web. Chrome also serves as the foundation for Chrome OS a computing system designed for and built entirely around the web. And Jeff Jarvis is we on brought the a lot of, of it together last October <laughs> by launching the Samsung Chromebook. What we Jeff viewed Jarvis as the perfect up and shows additional his pixel computer to the for everyone. At $249, with this thin, useful. light, yes. portable, and people are buying it as the second, third, fourth computer in their homes. It's been over 200 days since we launched, and it's been number one on Amazon in laptops for 190 consecutive days in that time window. Now we're going to explain the Chrome ecosystem Pixel. play, and we have many more partners joining our journey. Acer, Lenovo, HP are all shipping Chromebooks now. 
and we are expanding our presence in retail. Two months ago, we also announced the Chromebook Pixel. The goal behind the Pixel was literally to design the best laptop out there possible. The screen on this laptop is gorgeous. It's the highest resolution display that's ever shipped on a laptop, and it has full touch enabled. It's precision engineered with the best custom components available out there. Our goal with the Pixel was to get it in the hands of developers so that they can build the next generation of web experiences. That explains the price. Yeah. We're going to have a lot more to talk about Chrome OS later this year, and we are really investing a lot in this area. Do I hear but a I want boo to come out back there to in Chrome the crowd? for a minute. We talked about how in this multi-screen world, people are using different types of devices, including phones and tablets. With Chrome, our goal has been to make sure it's your web. You sign into Chrome, you get your experience consistently across all your devices, your web, everywhere, personalized for you. And to do that well, we really need to take mobile web forward. So we're going to show you an example of how the mobile web is evolving. What we are about to show you is a preview which Warner Brothers and the developers at North Kingdom have put together for the upcoming Hobbit movie. And we're going to, Ken is going to help me with this. We're going to get this up on screen. This is running on a pixel right now. And as you can see, you know, this is what the web shines for. You know, they want a trailer. They want a preview for their movie. You're not going to write an app and get everyone to install an app on every one of their devices. You write a web experience, and you expect people to use it independent of the device they have. So it's on a pixel. Thanks to HTML, 3D CSS, you can see it works great. Can can touch and move around. The clouds look great. And it works really well. So far, not that surprising. But we're going to switch now from a Chromebook Pixel to a tablet. And we're going to show Chrome running on Nexus 10. And you can see there is no difference in the experience. A lot of what we're going to talk about today is the same capabilities which you're used to on the Chrome on desktop are all coming to Chrome on Android. So ah. it feels exactly the same way you would see on a Pixel on a Nexus 10 as well. There were reports that Let's extensions were deeper. coming to tablet Chrome. Ken is going to start playing a game Chrome. on a Nexus 10. And this game, I guess the goal of this game is to, for the hobbits to avoid being eaten by the trolls. Uh, There's a new game upcoming. It is a 3D game, and it's based on WebGL. Can we get the game up on screen? You can see it there. And we are running this again on Chrome on Nexus 10. And the reason we are able to play this game is thanks to WebGL. You will, Aaron, is this a, a slow ballet towards merging? Yeah, Chrome and I think so. That's what I was, that's what I was alluding to okay, before, so is that you know, all the work they're doing in Chrome to Ken's get it to, to work across all platforms, once they get that dinner, done, uh, then you moment. might as well just run Android very, very on there. Your, uh, your laptop or a, or a netbook or whatever. Look, WebGL. Uh, instead of Chromebooks. You know, it's something and then you would launch Chrome. Chrome. You could have access to all the old web apps. you've got access to everything anyway. I think that the thing that they're... That's going to be how more difficult to do is to get all of the extensions that have been built for Chrome alert, running on your in a place called Rivendell, desktop mm -hmm. or laptop. And is, again, I don't think they'll be able to get those to run mobile, natively in Android. There's no easy port for those, I don't think. So that's the that's the difficult part. So there's going to be parts of this that eventually get left behind. Um, and people will probably be a little bit cheesed off over that. But I think it's the natural progression of things to move all this into Chrome as much as possible so that you can start to merge the Chrome OS with Android. Android. It's essentially what Netscape tried really to do to Windows in the late 90s when they threatened the to make Constellation and, and put the OS and into the browser. It was just way too far ahead of its there. time and Microsoft oh, yeah. had too so much tap power. Google's doing it to themselves, the stage, which frankly is a lot smarter. Yes, exactly. I forgot about that. I forgot about that. That was kind of, that was like very far thinking. Yeah, yeah. So just a few weeks ago, the web celebrated its 20th birthday. And the unique properties that transformed Which desktop computing on the birthday. web, the fact that everything is a link, everything is searchable by default, makes it possible with just a few keystrokes for anyone in the world to find billions of different web pages. Applications, video, content is instantly discoverable and shareable. No need to install software, no need to update software. And on the Chrome team, our goal is to make the web better. 
both on desktop and on mobile. Leo users, says, now a lot of verbiage on how great Chrome is. But that doesn't mean <laughs> loading the browser up full of features. So if you didn't need a bathroom the break, a means perhaps an this isn't and a so horror. So we're trying to figure out how to make the browser smaller and faster. So we focus on three things, speed, simplicity, and security. And we're bringing that same focus to mobile. Let's take a look at speed to start with. When we first launched Chrome, its JavaScript engine V8 was 20 times faster than anything else out there. And in the four and a half years since, we've continued to make it faster still. Just in the last year, you can see we've improved the performance of V8 by almost 25% on the desktop. But the gains on mobile are even bigger. In the last year, we've seen the performance improve by more than 50% on mobile. Do you These think we'll still hear about Chrome Babel in this, in this section? No, I think that'll be a separate section. These are the kinds of things that enable... Because that really, I think, is going to have to do a lot with Google Plus. Mobile web applications. And of course, the focusing on Google Plus as the centralized things, point of communications, even though it's going to run you know, ubiquitously, and we keep using that word across all the platforms, as these, that's what we assume. I think Google Plus will be the focus and not necessarily a Chrome itself, but we'll see. And this has gotten a lot of attention recently because it allows you to yeah, it, you're right. It, it isn't just a Chrome that you have thing. In C and, C++ and be able to run it on the web. Yeah, I mean, it's got a, you know, the rumors, of course, are that it's going to combine um, some of the other messaging, like Google Talk, which runs independently on your on your Android phone. And in the last um, it, alone, it runs independently from Google, from Chrome. So I think that's going to be a separate speed boost, a separate section. this asm.js code in V8, and there's tons more optimization to come. But of course, JavaScript is only one component of speed. When you download a web page, more than 60% of the bytes that come across your internet connection, and it's growing, up to an open source, royalty-free compression technology called WebP. Why do they name everything web in a so letter? So these two images here, you see the one on the left is JPEG, the one on the right is WebP. They're both at the same quality level. But let's take a look at the sizes. The WebP image is 30% smaller than the JPEG image at the same quality. Sarah, pay the attention. There's a cat with lasers coming out of its eyes shortly. <laughs> it saves on bandwidth. I'm on it. It saves on power, particularly on mobile computing devices. And we're seeing it adopted by properties like Google+, like Facebook, particularly on their mobile apps. Oh. And scene. Um, <laughs> so WebP supports not only lossless compression, but also lossy compression, transparency, color profiles, metadata, and um, unfortunately, animated images as well. Is this so, going to get pickup? I mean, I know he's saying like a lot of people are using it on mobile, so you can et cetera. Use PNG, you but can PNG. Use to replace JPEGs, PNGs, as well as This is really combining GIFs. JPEGs and PNG, the, the sure. and GIFs, I mean, all into one course, format, and it's an open format. So, so yeah, I think it will get picked up. By the end of 2012, over half of mobile internet traffic was video. We need to make videos smaller. With WebM, we've created an open, royalty-free container, media file format for the web. We're pretty so sure it's royalty-free. Two videos. We're 63% sure. One of these is sure. encoded, encoded in 264, which is probably what you're seeing today on the web. The other is encoded in WebM's next-generation codec, VP9. Mm. The bar charts show you the real-time bit rate of the two images. That's awesome. Two videos. When we get to the end, we'll see what the sizes of each are and how much smaller VP9 is. For this particular video. The graph, oddly enough, also shows the uh, total number of outstanding patents. For this particular models. video, VP9 <laughs> was 63% smaller. Running across a wide range of videos and a wide range of resolutions. I'll take that applause to me. Uh, they have a better idea of what it looks like because they're seeing a stream that's right. inside of a web page. Yeah, exactly. It's not exactly the uh, yeah. so highest resolution right now. Right. Uh, on, a, on a video that they handpicked to show. Yeah. And with beautiful it, saturated colors, see, right, which right. Right. compress very easily. <laughs> with all the uh, secret uh, compression uh, options selected now, that make it look like that. Of course, we want all websites to take advantage of these new technologies. Sorry, I'm a video snob, but you know, when it comes to compression, I'm a big fan of getting your files sizes smaller, but when you do that, uh, if that algorithm isn't smart enough, you get some of these horrible blockiness, yes. and if, even yeah. if they're talking about three megabits per second, that could be pretty nice. 
then you also have the issue of uh, of decoding this. Right. So can your current hardware handle this? Because H.264 is kind of a pig when it comes right. to that comes to processing. And then how is YouTube going to react to that when they do their bit on their end after you upload it to, to services like YouTube or Vimeo? I mean, that's another thing you have to, to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're better off uploading a larger file because you know that it's going to get reprocessed by Vimeo and, and uh, YouTube. Exactly. Let's so them make the other advantages of yeah. new technologies. But until they're everywhere, what we've done is we've built a data compression proxy for Chrome for Mobile. And you can see here, it's easy to turn on. You can go to bandwidth management, reduce data usage. And it shows At least you, you get how to much choose data you're this, actually saving. Whether you want the Google server so to be rewriting the pages. Real data for one user here. They say 40%, 6% of their data over the course of a month. And when we've been running this in the Android beta channel, and many of you can try it out right now, uh, we see an average of about 50% data compression. We rewrite the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to make it smaller. We transform images into WebP, and we speak the speedy network protocol to get you fewer bits faster, but get you all of the bits from the web page that you're looking so for. So this is a version of Opera Turbo? Yeah, we're way behind so now. Beyond wow. just making web pages faster, we want to make things faster and simpler for users. One of the hardest things you can do on your phone today is buy something. Uh, the average checkout process is about 21 steps on your phone. So it's no We started off talking about Chrome, and now we're doing uh, the abandonment rate purchasing on mobile. On yeah, mobile this phones. is kind of interesting. The it's around 97%. Swing here. I mean, we I guess it's, a, it's all about HTML5 coding is what So by building ties it all on the existing HTML5 compressing lots of things spec, like video and time. In Chrome, both on desktop and in mobile, <laughs> that collects all of your payment information when you enter it once, anywhere, syncs it across to all of your devices. So now, when you come to check out on a website, you press check out, you see this form. Chrome already knows all of your payment information. It shows it to you in a form. You can look at it and say, yep, that's what I want. And you click submit, and you're done. So this is going to make shopping from your phone much, much easier. This is going to make user profiles much more important than Android when you give your phone yes. to your kid yes. who is buying stuff left and right. Yeah. They do have, a, I mean, they do this now, though, and the feature session, where it says, uh, you want to remember want to this mm -hmm. for next time. Like, it'll remember uh, it for, like, a few minutes today, if you're purchasing called, multiple um, music files. Uh, um, but you have the option to say, has payments you know, in the name. that's I on the Play Store, though, right? This is on the web. On the Play Store, yeah. Standardizing payments. I'm assuming it'll work the same way. OK, so not just programs, not just users, but we also want to make developers more productive and make life simpler for them as well. So for the last couple of years, we've been working on some new fundamental technology in the web platform called Web Components. For the first time, you're going to be able to build your own HTML tags. You can build your own HTML tags by taking smaller bits of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and putting them into a first-class component. And that component can be reshared between applications, between phones, between tablets, between desktops, so that you can be much more productive and have applications that are much more delightful for users. Is this sort of a poor man's We're XML? We're working on the first toolkit to natively take advantage of web components. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I thought this, this was a, something really that um, the modern is that HTML, a new HTML5 seeing in a lot of the recent uh -huh. feature applications, particularly the mobile ones. I, I, I'm just trying to remember if it, I don't this think it's specific to Chrome, actually has been open I just think that Chrome is probably the first browser to support, it, upon to, it, to, to support it. it. Uh, but it's still very early. Uh, but the vision for it is clear. We want this elegant UI framework that works across all form factors, all devices. Uh, and we put together a short video to give you an idea about where we're going with the toolkit. Let's play the video. Obviously, if you start doing this, you're going to have to keep doing it or rewrite all your code. So is it, do you consider that lock-in? Not if it's part of HTML5, really, that what it means is that the other browsers need to start supporting these advanced features of HTML5. Right. It's like yeah, as long as you're right about the standard. That's yeah. Important. Yeah. Exactly. Assuming that I'm correct in my in what I remember. That also <laughs> looks like it makes it much easier to make your web app into a standard app for Android than it looks like. Yeah. Because if you're using the same the same language everywhere, what's the difference at that point? Yeah. But then the other thing it opens up is what about um, other mobile operating systems like Tizen that are completely dependent on HTML5. Mm. Um, that it, I mean, it it may be a boon for them as well. So you can see our goal here really is to be able to allow developers like you create your own tags, reuse them in a way that makes sense on a phone, be able to take that same component, reuse it on a tablet, combine them in different ways for desktop applications. 
And it's something that's tremendously exciting. It's still early, as I said. It's not ready for consumption by regular developers. But if you're interested in learning more about where we're going and help us define the vision of the future, please come to the Web Components in Action session on Thursday. You can create your own Blink tag and re-implement We've been talking today a lot about Chrome across all of your different screens. So why not build a fun experience to show that off? Now, a lot of you in the chat room know what's coming. Demo fail. Because if, you, if you're watching live and you want so the most up-to-date information, really, it's Leo in the chat room. He's, and all you need he to is play in is front of all the bloggers. <laughs> device, Android or iOS, phone or tablet, you just need to click a link and get started. So we've asked some volunteers to come help us show it off. They said they've asked for volunteers. So while they're coming up, why don't we take a closer look at the devices here? And now it turns into a magic show. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind stepping into this box. Well, that turns <laughs> As he pulls out a big saw. We'll turn this Android into a Chrome. <laughs> this is a perfectly normal Google developer. You have a ringer, <laughs> I can see. This is Arno Weber. Up my the uh, Chrome mobile team. He's an actual race car driver. We'll see how he does in the electronic form. So, so this game is, uh, is a simple little racing game. I don't know uh, Leo if says it didn't fail. So racing goodness. games when you were a kid, you pull the trigger, zoom around the track, but if you go too fast, the car spins out. <laughs> Apparently, That's it has a lovely what finish. going to be trying to do. Like a good wine. So, so are we ready to switch to the overhead? Oh, that's a cool shot. Okay, this is what's supposed to be so impressive. Let's watch it. It's an iPad Mini in Chrome. I mean, you're running Chrome. So this right game now. is really simple. Um, once I start the game, all you iPhone have to do 5, is press down to accelerate Nexus, I, Nexus. and let go <laughs> to decelerate. Basically, when you go around the uh, corners, you don't want to be going too fast. So I'm going to start a race here, and I'm going to join it from these devices. The That's colored things cool. plugged in, are, I think, are just power sources. They're not okay. part of this. Let me click Start. You know, you guys look like professionals, so I'm going to click Ridiculous. No. <laughs> We're going to go ridiculous on this one, guys. I predict lots of cars will fly off the yeah. track. All right. Um, so you've got so five you different devices, so five different screen okay, sizes. I'm going to use the iOS device. and uh, One game. Uh, tap when you're One ready. iOS device, a bunch right. of Android devices. This is interesting. You, you might not want to hold on yet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's really cool. Get a little ahead of ourselves. We're going to need larger tables for this. Yeah. All right. Oh, the first oh, no. car goes spinning off. Ah. <laughs> uh, this is crazily sci-fi like. Yeah, like just put your devices together and they all have one screen. Right. And it's able to keep all the different. Now devices obviously they don't have to be they don't have to be sitting next to each other, which will make it no, even more it's not running into me. And it uses web audio as the sound transitions between all the different devices. But uh, it looks like they're controlling well, them in real time. Full lab. Yeah. So they would have to be within viewing. Because oh, you're controlling your car on another device. Oh, they're swearing going on. <laughs> Come on. I didn't practice all these days. It's a really frustrating I game. I would love to see that with web video. Yeah, way. exactly. Like, like, do you, you have a tablet there? I have my tablets. Put it together and let's right. watch this really large. Yeah. <laughs> put put, a, put a bunch of them together. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when you run Android on, uh, you keep, on your big screen TV? Then you put a bunch of big screen TVs together. You, and you have a huge <laughs> panel <laughs> for gaming. or Easily done. Yeah. It's all right. It's all right. I think yeah. we got enough. We got the first. Can. Congratulations. As he breathes a big sigh of release. The demo worked. Anyway, um, thank you all for helping with that. <laughs> he really is breathing hard. I mean, he's like, <laughs> I think anyway, he was worried about it. Wow. We That's cool, though. He sounds like he's on Valium VR, anyway. So yeah. About where the mobile web, web is headed. That's a hell of a, uh, just the sinking the of all of that. Years of the web, yep. We put together the short film showing how far we've come. Short film is always better than interpretive dance, as uh, we found out. Nice, Linux. Oh, this is cute. I'm a sucker for historical web stuff. Where's Gopher? This is the web. It's about the web. It's oh, not sorry. about other... No Archie, no Gopher. You didn't have to refresh your page all the time. Yeah. It's like, yeah.
HTML5 still isn't certified, right? I don't think so. Certified like by the like it's not it's not it hasn't been implemented as the standard yet. For what? For video or it yeah, is a it is a standard. Four point three official. It hasn't been ratified. Oh, I think it has actually. I think it's been ratified by the, what is it, the WCC? Inspiring to see the many years story of the web. Uh, it's Can't truly one of the most HTML amazing software platform we've seen in our lives. Regulatory body. Uh, before we move on, let's get a picture of the pixel uh, back up on the screen. Uh, I'm also going to go pick one up. Uh, as I said earlier, our goal W3C, behind the pixel thank you, Red uh, was to Lin literally build Link. the best laptop right. possible right. out there. That's where I learned it. Do you guys have any idea why we have it up on the screen and I'm holding one up in my hand? I was thinking of WWF. Why? Because I have one and you don't. Ha! Next. A W3C has proposed to release a stable HTML5 recommendation by the end of 2014. We're going to give each and every one of you oh, okay. a, a brand new pixel. What? I've been asked to say it's not ready till 2 p.m., so please don't leave you in the middle of the keynote. It's a candidate uh, right, right uh, now. But we are very excited. Our goal behind the pixel was to make sure developers had a chance to get it's the web the ready cost of admission the next right generation there? experience with full touch and high resolution. So I can't wait to see what you all uh, do with it. We are incredibly excited. A lot of us use it as our Daedric computer. Leo doesn't like it, so I'll take his. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked about Android and Chrome. And our goal behind these platforms is to make sure developers can build amazing experiences on top of these platforms. We want to now give you a real life example of how this all comes together. And we're going to do that by talking about education briefly. A lot of us at Google are deeply passionate about education. Because it's an area where we can really see the impact technology can have on people's lives, especially the lives of children. And so we are, we are investing a lot in education. And for us, the journey started with Google Apps. So you're going to start chipping Google children? Google Apps are incredibly <laughs> popular in schools around the world. Vocational word children. There are over 25 million users of Google Apps in over 200 countries all around the world in schools, in universities. He's going to take so a pot shot at Dartmouth here in a minute. Just in the United States, 74 of the top 100 universities fully run on Google Apps. Seven of the top eight, seven of the eight Ivy League universities, for those of you who are from Dartmouth, you may want to start nudging your IT administrator there. But seven of the I hope eight this is good Ivy news. A friend of mine is on the school board Google and he's Apps. trying to get, Large they wanted to put iPads like in uh, one of the Chicago, elementary schools. Completely run on Google Apps. And he's pushing them to go Android. And the momentum is incredible. Um, for the openness of the platform further. as well as for the um, what we want to do is to bring both the cost, Android and quite Chrome frankly, of the devices that they can get. Institutions around the world. Because they can get twice so as many Android, Google, device, Android tablets all of as they can, can build applications iPads. to really change how computing and technology is used in schools. We are beginning to invest a lot for Android in education, and we want to give you an update. To do that, I'm going to invite Chris Yerga back on stage. So you can look at his t-shirt. Thanks, Sundar. So as we've heard, Android is growing oh, incredibly fast. Oh, it's the I.O. logo. And it's it's mirroring the I.O. logo, right? But or is it? Still Somebody said it's just a throwback to the all of or our lives 3D. Lives and the lives of well, that's what I was saying. If I put on my red-blue uh, 3D really glasses, I actually get one when Android in 3D. I go visit my kids' 3D. classroom, it looks <laughs> pretty much exactly like it did when I went to school. No, it's, so it's a bunch of us at Android ask educators, why is there so much talk about technology in schools, but so little impact? And what we heard Somebody was really told interesting. Him to open his code Teachers a more told us so that in see. education, there's a huge gap between what's possible with technology and what's practical, especially with mobile technology. And then they told us it was Google's job to fix this. <laughs> Google should make it affordable to give every student a tablet. And Google should make it so that it's not so crazy to manage all those devices. And Google finally should make it way easier to find the best tools and content from a really diverse set of developers and get that content to the right students. We agreed. So today, I'm really excited to announce a new initiative, which will make it easy and affordable for schools to put Android tablets in the hands of all their kids and to load and them up Google's with going head to head with Apple. Yeah. Apple always emphasizes education. And I want to give you a sneak peek of one of the yep. key parts of this effort, Google Play for Education. 
built from the ground up wow. to meet the unique content needs of educators. Looks like I'm gonna have to so call my buddy up after we get done here. <laughs> this is a huge, yeah. huge uh, it's thing a for him. For teachers. Yeah. So the first thing you'll notice is that Google Play for Education is organized by categories educators care about, namely subject matter and grade level. For example, say I'm the K-6 math subject matter expert in my school district, and I want to find an educational app that my incoming kindergartners can use to sharpen their problem solving skills. So I click on math, kindergarten, and immediately I see a bunch of apps from a diverse set of partners, including NASA and PBS. Also, each app has been recommended by a group of educators as useful for teaching kindergarten math. This All is right. key some, some because curation. teachers trust other teachers. What if there's like a teacher console so, so you can see uh, the kids are using the apps properly? Kids numbers <laughs> uh, and math from IntelliJoy looks really good. Uh, I'll start with the free version. Remember, I'm not shopping for myself here uh, because this school is using Google Apps for Education and every student has a Google account. I can just enter the name of the Google group of these students and bam, all 500 That's kindergartners cool. in my district will instantly get this app on their tablets. That's really cool. Okay, so they all have to have Google accounts. Some people may chafe at that. Well, you get that at birth now, right? Your yeah, social security card, you're right. at Gmail by, address. And I'm really impressed with the math skills that kids are learning from kids' numbers in math, so I want to upgrade to the paid version so the kids can go deeper. Uh, rather than enter a credit card, which is not how schools work, I can just charge these 500 licenses against a balance funded by a school purchase order. And one more thing, notice that the store doesn't just have apps. You can discover books and YouTube educational videos and push them to Android tablets in exactly the same way. Courses? Would there be like <laughs> unicorns? Mm. <laughs> Perhaps Google will get you from the very beginning. You're going to Pilot be on Google sites forever. like Kitbridge Charter School right. and Hillsborough Township Public Schools are already going crazy for this. Six elementary schools in New Jersey used 550 different third-party apps during a single day in our pilot. All of them discovered and downloaded by teachers in Google Play for Education. This is great, though, Multiply actually. That I mean, because millions of classrooms in the U.S. schools don't want to be putting in the infrastructure cost to, to do this on their own. Students, you know, because these are services that schools actually would like to have. You know, we're, we're saying, yeah, they all exist in the Google, Google play for education, you know, ecosystem, schools, right? But the fact that they're doing this, this will actually save schools a lot of time now from putting in all the security mechanisms, all the stuff awesome that they would have to do to do this on their own. Um, and they could well, use a service like this Google to do it instead. In and as we'll see in a second, uh, but starting this summer, we'll sell be them a bunch of Chromebooks. Your app uh, that too. Check out our because of the, the administration ease of a Chromebook fits into this app store perfectly for a school system. That's right. Awesome K app. If they didn't give away pixels, also they could just hand out tablets for free to everybody, I think, in the country. Maybe they'll do that. If you buy a certain amount of tablets, you get all the administrators get pixels. It's an incentive program. Yeah. Why not? It's great to see Android making its foray into education. We're going to invest a lot. We've already been doing this with Chromebooks. Chromebooks are really ideally suited for education because there's literally no setup, no administration. You open the device, you're good to go, and you have the power of web within you. Just last year alone, we have over 1,000 schools in the United States running Chromebooks. In the four months this year, we've added 2,000 new schools and Chromebooks are going mainstream in education in schools in the United States, just like Google Apps. And the area where this all came together beautifully is Malaysia. So I want to talk about that for a minute. Malaysia has a nationalized education system. They have 10,000 schools in the country distributed, several of them in poor rural areas. So they really wanted to provide 4G connectivity throughout to all 10,000 schools to level the playing field. And they are deploying Google Apps along with Chromebooks in primary and secondary schools so that they can bring computing in their schools. So let's take a look at what they're doing. Malaysia has so much to offer. There's so much untapped potential. Oops. Just to walk into one of these small villages and look at the eyes of those children in that school, you see that spark, little fire in their eyes. There's this whole world out there that would allow you to experience learning beyond what you ever thought possible. Wow. This Phil Phillips song is And epic. a lot of our students yeah. don't have internet. His middle name is also a Phil. A lot of them were <laughs> left behind. It's in Malaysia, we place a huge investment in the education of our young children. It's in so many commercials. We're providing... Home and Garden television. ...to all schools across the country. 
And the fact that we can spread it across 10,000 schools is amazing. Learning had to be anytime, anyplace. You didn't have to be in a state-of-the-art classroom, but you could be with a Chromebook sitting in a field and experiencing world-class learning. As it long as you have so an internet connection. Well, yeah, I was going to say, as long as that field gets good Wi-Fi. Right. This I guess it or well, LTE if you have a pixel. Yeah, they were saying, they were talking earlier about how they the deployed it because they have LTE mm -hmm. deployed across yeah. the country, so... Makes so sense. It's going to take a while for the U.S. to get on board with that. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. Unless Google Fiber goes so everywhere. the kid's going to be able right. to afford a pixel, though? Oh, the Samsung. Just the really rich kid who get, who's going to get uh, out of flat for it. Look, to me and to a lot of us, this is what the journey of computing is about. What we are doing in education, on top of platforms like Android and Chrome, we can do it for users everywhere, including the other 5 billion people on the planet. Android and Chrome are designed for not just Google, but for you all to create amazing experiences. We're going to switch now and talk about what we are doing on Google, what we call as the best of Google, on top of Android and Chrome. You're going to hear from three teams, from the Google Plus team, from the Search team, and from the Maps team. And we'll get things started with Vic Gandotra and Google+. Among the most basic human needs is the need to connect with others. With a smile or laugh, we connect with people every single day. But the meaning of our real-world connections often gets lost online. And so began the Google Plus project to help make connecting online more like we do in real life. You friend a bunch of people so you don't talk to. the things you love. <laughs> with the people you love and get closer to the I don't know who's blogging for The Verge, but they were Google Plus guys, clear eyes, full hearts. I can't lose. Gandhi Man says, is this turning from a developer conference to a press event? No, these these are meant to inspire the developers and get them all fired up. Yeah, that was actually an inspiration circle for Google Plus. Well, they get fired up and then they make stuff that makes the public fired up. Exactly. You get fired up, we we'll all get fired up, it'll be anarchy. Wait, no. <laughs> you guys have the greatest technology at your fingertips. I thought Chad was on screen again. I did too at first. <laughs> Thanks everybody. I didn't see the I didn't see the Conan hair in my uh, oh, my so photo of or effects plug in. Plug -in. Yeah. I'll have to take a look at that again. This is celebration Thanks. All of that done by Pixel Core. We are incredibly grateful to the hundreds and millions of uh, you out there who joined Google Plus uh, in just under two short years. And we can think of no better way to say thank you than to continue to innovate and to build a product that people truly love. And so I'm here to show you what's next with Google Plus. Today, we're introducing 41 new features across three major areas of Google Plus. Oh boy. First, a new newly designed stream, a new Hangouts application, and a Ooh. fundamentally new Photos experience. Please we have a lot to talk it. about. Let's Hang get started. It. Let's begin with the stream. See if it gets interrupted now by a, no surprise uh, any sky jumpers this year. are increasingly prevalent and important in our lives. It's the computer that's with us all the time. And so the Google Bus team has spent a lot of time making sure that that core stream experience on mobile absolutely rocks and the feedback has been fantastic. And this so could be today, what we hear about Babel. We're taking that multi yeah, this is what I predicted, is that bringing it to Babel would be Hangouts. Devices. Hangouts yeah. would be, yes. would be the your brand name, right? Your tablet, and everything would and get incorporated into desktop, Hangouts. You're going to see a newly designed stream. We're also fixing a long-standing problem with today's social streams, and that's they're flat. It's very easy to see a long list of things that have been shared with you. That's what the red and blue like Android was about. 3D streams. Mm -hmm. but this is what all of the Google Reader developers got pulled off to work on. Topic or interest that you might have. And we think we can fix that. So this new design, is, this new stream, is about design and depth. Maybe the best thing to do is just show you. What you're looking at is Google Plus at its best this morning. What you're going to see start rolling out uh, later today is the new Google Plus, which looks like this. Mm. So it looks it's a lot like It's very the... pretty. Oh. 
Is better, use, better use of space, at least. You can Pinterest see, Plus. That Plus of the tablet interface that's all over yeah, the tablet Google interface. Plus. Yeah. Made something beautiful. It's, um, it looks really nice. Dynamic. Meaning depending on the size of your screen, might be hard to like one column, two Some columns, people don't. Columns. This is a very popular on Tumblr to too. Some choice. people find this so layout you under the more menu, uh, you're too much. Able yeah, to to I always find this layout brilliant for advertising because you'll right. just scan every card course, until you're like, oh, yeah. it's an ad. Yeah, yeah. darn it. We've made sure that yeah, I don't. Uh, posts, I don't know if I'm into this. I like my linear scroll down column. You can. That's awesome. Because I'll change. Yeah, he just mentioned that, that you can change views to a single column. So oh, that's we good. Put yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like the iPad app. Product. Product. Mm -hmm. For example, a share box that animates out, menus that slide in and yeah, out. Yeah, this is this is flatly. The, this is the, this is their tablet cards, yeah. app and, uh, as a web app. Flip yeah. and fade beautifully. Yeah, it's pretty it's amazing. Very uh, metro. If I'm right. Right. <laughs> a little, little metro. Oh, nice crowd shot. They're just doing everything Microsoft's already done. But it's not just I don't like metro design, so. It's about depth. Oh, this is um, as I mentioned cards. earlier. It's, okay. it's very difficult to go deeper on a topic or an interest you care Speaking about. Speaking of cards, this would integrate we really well with solve this problem. Um, um, and today Google we're now, introducing yeah. related hashtags. And Google Now would fit right in here. So. What we'll do is mm -hmm. we'll analyze. But the to me, it, of a this kind of layout looks and confusing. We'll except for things like Pinterest, hashtag. where you you want to be How kind of surprised look? by something and you're Let's not really paying attention. But here's a post about the San Francisco Giants baseball team. It's not just about the. It's about Buster Posey, a particular player as well and note in the top we've automatically tagged that post and we know it's about uh, those two topics but hmm. that's only half the magic we also then rank uh, and, and search the entire universe of Google Plus content and we rank it just for you so when Matt clicks on one of those hashtags watch what happens we flip the card over and we then show you related items from Very the cool most nice. important sources and social proximity to you. Amazing, isn't it? Scary, but amazing. Now, if you think that's impressive, let's take a look at another one of these posts. Um, in this case, one of the noted photographers on our service has posted a picture of Paris, in particular the Eiffel Tower. Nowhere in his post or in the comments is the word Eiffel Tower. But if you notice, Google has automatically hashtagged this with the Eiffel Tower. How did we do that? Well, we did image analysis and combined with the knowledge graph that recognizes important landmarks, and Google knew that this was about the Eiffel Tower. So if you click, why, well, you can just go deeper and click through other posts about the Eiffel Tower. And we're going to cease and desist letters from buildings and have to be blurred out. <laughs> now, of course, we deeply respect the content producer. And so you always have the option of telling Google either on a particular post or globally, whether you want your content to have this amazing related hashtag All feature. Right, and if we ever get it wrong and have the wrong hashtag, you could always exit out. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I want case, pictures of my kids to be built here mm. hashtag a stream for, that's about design. Mm -hmm. Especially with an automatic <laughs> upload on really Google+. Yeah, exactly. Deeper on your interests. I mean, at least those aren't now, shared automatically, but still. show you all of the features. This is not your child. Yes, wait, what? <laughs> There's just too many. To talk it knows about a little today, bit too much. We'll be rolling this out. <laughs> the neighbor is the father. We hope that you'll absolutely love it. Okay, now let's talk about Hangouts. Oh, Hangouts. They said Hangouts for some uh, reason. We have a point of view about software and technology, namely that it should get out of the way uh, and allow people to do what they do best. That's live, learn, and love. Uh, that was true even when we started Google Plus. You know, other sites when we started often asked you to live, learn, and your love. relationships as either Jeez. friends or not friends. That's what I do. And we argued that was not reflective of real life. In real life, you don't have this, you have this. And so we built circles as a core part of Google Plus. And we're happy to report that today, more than half of all sharing that's done on Google Plus is done to private circles. Now, that same dynamic exists in the world of real time communications. When you think about a real-time communication, somebody you want to talk with, um, you don't think about wanting to talk to a computer. You want to talk to Theo's a person. Theo's saying Babel is Hangouts. Yet, I want to see how this works out. 50 yeah. years of work in real-time communication products, we still are stuck with gadgets that get in the way. Who is using a CRT? Think for a moment about <laughs> some of the real-time communications products, the choices that you have. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to wear a flat are very nice. I mean, they work well, on one platform. Point. So if you think about your friend, you have to ask yourself, are they on a particular operating system? Here we go. Why should OSs matter? People matter. 
or think about other choices that are very popular on mobile. Like Windows tiles. Fantastic ways to communicate on mobile, but if your brother is at work on a desktop or a laptop, why should he be left out? Or there are other solutions that do group video very, very well and messaging, but it's very difficult to do photos. Frankly, even Google's own services have been fragmented uh, and, uh, and, and confused at times. What we want to do is fill in all the boxes. Because when we fill in all the boxes, we believe finally technology can just go away and people can focus on what makes them the happiest. And that's just hanging out. So we're introducing today a new application, Hangouts. And we think we've built a product that is about conversations that last with people that you love. Let me show you the product. Now, as Matt what about people goes I just to the like? demo here, the first thing you'll notice on Matt's uh, Android phone is the new icon, a standalone app. Uh, and Matt will go ahead and click on Hangouts and open up the application. Now, you're looking here at a list of conversations, uh, not contacts. Some of those conversations are one-on-one. -on -one. Some of those conversations are group conversations. But the primary pivot, the focus, is on those conversations. Now, if Matt wants to get to his contacts, maybe he wants to add someone, it's one tap away. You can see Google will rank the important uh, people that he normally talks to and make that easily available for either a message or a video call. But let's go back to the conversations. There's several attributes about these conversations that, are, uh, that I want to talk about. The first is my favorite. And that is these conversations can be long lasting. So as Matt goes back in time, why you're able to see that conversation. Imagine that you have your family in a conversation for many months or a year. There's the useful? holiday party, there's the vacation you took together, there's important moments like, a, uh, like the birth of a child. All those things are stored with you, even as, uh, even as you change devices in those long running conversations. Of course we give you the That's ability key. to turn off history. Of course, we give you the ability to delete those things. But as he's saying, as you change devices, I think that's really key to this type of platform. So it's not like SMS where you can keep this running dialogue going. Is that the conversations but are as soon as you go to a different phone, um, you've lost your, your SMS messages if you didn't back them up. This is amazing. This baby's not even three months old and he's already learned how to face palm. Okay. Um, <laughs> but all the images that you've shared as a family are all right there. Um, in addition to beautiful images that are easily stored and saved, the conversation feels alive. Look at the bottom. You can there see, as, as people join, they show up. As they're typing, they animate out. You can see exactly where someone has read to. It really feels like you're in the same room together. And we think that's, that's delightful. Uh, by the way, you're looking at it on the web, you're looking at it on Android, and you're looking at it on iOS, all available today. Wow. Just like uh, Google Messenger. All available today. Yeah, that's great. I mean, he's not, at least not yet, he hasn't said that those services are going away, but I'm assuming they will. And by the way, two other points. One is a point that Hugo made. I think you're going to love how the notifications are all synced. So if you wipe a notification from the desktop or an and on an Android, it'll go away on another device. It's beautiful. I think you'll like that. But my favorite feature... I mean, this really should replace uh, Google sorry Talk about that. and Let's go back Google to the demo. Messenger. Uh, well, per, what would be perfect is if it's just seamless, right? I mean, Google Talk already is, shows Google, up in Google+. Plus. Yeah. So if it just... The best way to all of a sudden, Google Talk in your Gmail is, is to face Hangout. To face. Yeah. And so in that conversation, Matt can tap on that video icon, and everyone in that conversation will be dropped into a video chat. There you can see Matt. He's into the video chat, and everyone's being dropped in. Group video at no charge. Cool. This video fantastic. thing will be contained in that stream. Are you going to have a recorded version of that? Yeah, that's true. That won't be... You won't have a history of that, will you? Or maybe okay, it'll be automatically recorded. You can watch on YouTube if you choose. It's curious on that one. Okay, now let's switch topics. And finally, let's talk about photos. Photography can be a very rewarding experience. Um, I know for me, it captures the most important moments of my life. I remember when I was on the beach and I asked my kids to stand together to take a picture. I didn't know my son was going to wrap his arms around my daughter. I didn't know my daughter was going to reach up and hold his hand. But for the rest of my life, I'm going to picture them like this. Despite the fact that he's now taller than me, that's how I imagine it. Parents. I'm not alone. <laughs> You My heartstrings won't be pulled. Amazing <laughs> images that are the most important, precious uh, memories of your life. 
But if we're honest with each other, we'll also admit that photography is very labor intensive. It takes a lot of time to organize, edit, enhance, upload, and share your photos. Time that many of us don't have. At Google, we think we can give you some of your time back. So is this going to tie into the, your uh, camera to the larger cloud, size of drive, the 15 gig versus 5 gig that they just announced? Oh, yeah, the fact they unified all of that? You. Yeah. So they, but they're giving you 10 gig more. They used to only give you 5 gig for free. And now they're giving you 15. I thought it was 15 across your Gmail and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Photos, photos, Gmail, and Drive. You have 15 gig instead of 5 now. And we're going to talk about three exciting new areas uh, that combine the data center, Google's cloud, with photography. But before I do that, let me just begin with what you already know, backup. Now, since we've launched Google+, we've always backed up your photos, uh, unlimited all your photos at standard size. And a few months ago, we introduced the ability for you to choose an option where we would upload your photos, not at standard size, but at full resolution. And we offered five gigabytes free. This week, we announced that we're going from 5 gigabytes to 15 gigabytes. There you go. Oh, so this is the part we knew so far, right? Now, so this was announced the other full, day, a couple days ago. Full resolution matter. Well, what you're looking at here is an 8 megapixel uh, shot. 8 megapixel shot, you know, you can clap if you want. Go ahead. The services don't actually remove the other parts of your I photo. I love it when you clap, and I can't <laughs> even make the point on the slide. It's great. Yeah, with Facebook, all you, you get, get is it. your butt. You know, Sorry uh, about that. Eight <laughs> megapixels is pretty common. Some cell phones, like the uh, Galaxy S4, go up to 13 megapixels. And when you have an important image, you don't want 619 pixels, or 1024, or 2048. You want all the pixels, because some memories are not meant to be downsized. And we give you that ability on Google+. Let's move on. Now let's talk about highlight. What you're looking at is 686 of my vacation photos from my trip to New Zealand. And he's going to tell us about each one. there's some beautiful images in there. It's called images the carousel. I want to share. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but I don't have time to pick them out because my vacation is over. OK? Now, I suspect you've been in the same boat. You know, you, it takes time to do all this stuff. Um, Google can pick the best pictures for you. We can go from these 686 pictures what? to these. It's remarkably accurate. Now, well, it, we know you so It takes well. out blurry photos. It looks for smiles. That's yeah. reading Some ahead on the blog. Saying, How did Google uh, know those were the best? Let me tell you. We do lots of things my eyes to off the, the live best. Stream Some for of the things second. that we do is we look for images that are blurry, and they're not going to make the highlights. We look for images that are duplicates. Du I took the four images of the same mountain. We'll pick one. We look for images that are not the greatest exposure, and they're unlikely to make your highlights. Or we even do amazing things, like we recognize the Eiffel Tower. We can recognize in your images if you're at an important landmark. In this case, this is a beautiful shot of Queenstown. And we boost that image so that it's more likely to make the highlights. We also analyze to see if there are people there. Are the people happy? Are they smiling? <laughs> Might make the highlights. Our machine learning algorithms have also been uh, trained by literally hundreds of human raters. So that the machine learning algorithms have now begun to account for aesthetics, for human taste. What do people find beautiful? And we're able to boost that image. And then my favorite is affinity. Uh, Spartacus and I both heard him say uh, human raters. Like the <laughs> family circle, and we apply appropriate social boost so that your wife and your children are in the highlights. It's absolutely amazing. We think it's better than silent radio. Right? This is kind of terrifying, uh, gonna say but awesome. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we know yeah. exactly what you like to see. It's kind of the theme of this whole IO keynote, isn't it? Yeah. Awesome, but terrifying. Awesome I think that's on the terrifying. printed on the tickets. <laughs> this is a shot of what we're rolling out this evening. This is the actual product, the desktop version. You'll note that we'll give you your highlights, and right there at the bottom, you can always click and see all the other images as well. Well, just sticking um, with so the it's, unification it's theme, like I mean, they've, they've been doing some of this stuff in about, um, enhancing uh, images. Picasso, my mm -hmm. for a while, face recognition and, and smile versus frowns and, and that kind of stuff. And They've had this technology. It sounds like they're just really, again, rolling it into more of an online can take a good online version. It yeah, it's the ben again, that benefit of focus we were talking about earlier. Yep. Like this. Powerful tools that require lots of skills, 
that run on expensive machines, that take lots of time, and you can do amazing things. The problem is, is that for the average person, these tools often look like this to them, like a bewildering set of knobs that they don't understand. That Today, makes sense. Today, looks good to me. We're introducing Auto Enhance. With that. Auto Enhance is an easy button to make your memories look beautiful. Oh, come on. Voice activated too. Like we've never like heard this. of something like this before. And make it look like this. Well, this is, the, again, this is a feature in Picasso. It's a clarity filter. Well, we're going to show the you some of the buttons. things. It's the auto enhance button from Picasso, uh, like at which I use distribution, skin quite a bit, actually. Noise It'll do it for you, I would imagine, right? Vignetting, I mean, red eye reduction. No, I think it, well, it looks so like it's still a button, but, or you have to turn it on. It's an option. To show you all of them, but we're going to highlight I just want to look at my Nexus 7 and say, enhance. All of us have taken pictures that are over or underexposed. You might think Google would find the middle ground. We do better than that. Remember, our algorithms take into account human taste. So we can take an image like this and just make it perfect. Let me show you another example. Let me show you another example. Let's talk about skin softening. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance because you're going to see a is good huge photo of skin me. Softening. And we thought yep. we'd pick someone that no one could get offended over. So yes. we'll, we'll start that with me. OK, now let's talk about <laughs> recognizing people's faces. If you have an inexpensive phone or um, a, 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 even an inexpensive camera, those devices can recognize faces. But the state of the art today is to put a rectangle around a face and say, we think there's a face there. We've had several breakthroughs at Google. They have a circle, actually, Google Plus. We're now able to Google deeply right. recognize the human face and skin. Square. We can tease apart exactly where is the hairline. What are the eyes? The can they teeth? add more is hair? Is the person that wearing be, jewelry? Would be good Do they me. have glasses on? And we can separate all that out. That breakthrough means that when we do the other effects, things like structure, uh, uh, the tonal enhancement, why we can do something different on the clouds, the water, the mountains, and we can treat the human face completely separately, like a professional would in a tool. Now, let's talk about one of those effects. Let's talk about skin softening. Now, how many of you like your passport or your driver's license photos? N no one does. I like my license well, photo. Well, why not? Because photographs often no exaggerate our flaws. In real life, when you look at me or your friends, you don't see every one of their flaws. But in a picture, you see all of them. In fact, we're going to make it Oh, worse. no, I see them in Let's real zoom life. zoom in on this picture a little bit. Believe me, I know. <laughs> like I said, I, I used my own, so I wouldn't offend anyone else. Um, wrinkles, right? But chances are, when you're talking to me, you don't stare at them. Watch what happens when we apply skin softening. Just gently it's great. Tone so down. you share your Zoom photos. When you meet out. the person That's in real life, you're like, wow, image. you look horrible yeah, exactly. in real life. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You look so much great. different. What in women's photos magazines online. get criticized for, Google will do it automatically. love it when we apply this across your <laughs> the phone. enhanced you. Right. Let's talk about noise reduction. Maybe with Google Glass, you can um, see that maybe person's face softened. Low light. <laughs> uh, particularly with a, with a cell phone. You get grain, noise on your image. Look at the sky in this photograph. Well, our noise reduction filters can automatically take something that looks like this and make it look like that. That's pretty nice. Pretty amazing. That's really good for low light Let's pictures, talk about actually. Yeah. Here's a picture a uh, that I took uh, when I was in New Zealand. That's right. I remember that image having more life. It was more vivid. Well, what happened? Well, the camera palette balanced everything out, so it became flat. A professional would go with flat. A professional would go into a tool and they would add a lot Are more Are they spending too the much sky. time on this? Uh, we can do that Is it just me? I mean, so I believe it's been about like seven this, days. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. People, like some that. people are really into photography. Right? You're probably doing this a lot more. There's obviously that. lots more uh, that we don't have time to talk about, but we, we're, we are going to bring up a special tool, a debugging tool. And we're going to tease apart some of these effects and show you how they layer on to make an image awesome. So here's an image, um, untouched out of the camera, and we're going to start layering on these enhancements. Let's begin with tonal enhancement, OK? Let's add some skin softening. Before and after on the skin softening. Skin softening now sounds let's add really some gross. Structure for the yeah, it does. That's a bad name. It's like, it's like melting. To emphasize the human face. And let's go before and then auto enhance. You know, while he softens his skin Pretty again, let's, let's thank it? our sponsor for Twitlive's breaking news coverage. Slingbox. Uh, one, if you don't know about example. the Slingbox 500, check it out. Built-in Wi-Fi, HDMI connectivity, full HD 1080p. Allows you to watch your favorite TV shows in high def 
wherever you go. You can wirelessly archive your photos and videos. You got them all touched up. Enjoy them on your TV at home, wherever you go. Uh, and the picture quality is amazing. I use it all the time. Uh, you buy a sling box, hook it up to your TV, hook it up to the internet. Now you can watch your home TV anywhere in the world. You don't have to have a special programming package. You don't have to pay anything extra above and beyond the software and hardware you buy. There's no service fee every month. Uh, no monthly fees. Never miss a show you want to watch. Get your sling box today at Best Buy or Amazon. Check it out at slingbox.com slash twit. Without Slingbox, we wouldn't have the breaking news coverage. So thank them and we thank them for their support of Twit Breaking News. When that clicks on that enhanced icon, we'll go back to the original. Now back if you let go, you'll see your the lighthouse photo. And if you want, you can click under the gotcha. more menu and you can always turn this on or off, either globally or on an individual photograph. Um, so we think this is amazing and it's going to save you lots of time. Let's continue on. We've talked about backup. We've talked about enhancing. This is all cool, but what about photos. an API yeah. uh, to actually? Now let's talk about so develop. And this is a developer Auto conference, right? I mean, what about a Google Plus image. API. The We've turned the corner, exists. right? It was uh, very developer-friendly, very developer-heavy. We had cool developer stuff in that first hour, and now it's become much more front-facing, much more consumer-oriented. We're taking around the same time together. I think Vic wanted to show off his vacation photos. Yeah, I think that's all it was. I was in New Zealand, everybody. For three hours, we've been listening. <laughs> An animated GIF. What? Oh, yay. More of that. Oh, look, it's Google I don't think Vine. keynotes should ever Maybe be over two hours. Shots of children. They're never I wish we could have done that in the time. 90s. Go oh, wait. back to your album. You'll see a <laughs> GIF for you. You'll have another one of these auto awesome motions. By the way, over the past two weeks, in a dark launch state, we've gone through all the albums you've hosted on Google and gifted all of these to you. You'll see them turned on this afternoon. So uh, several are people five. are pointing out it's an animated web key, not an animated GIF. We're introducing five auto awesome effects today. You saw a demonstration of motion. Let me briefly talk about the others. If we recognize that you have multiple portraits together of people, we will automatically create a collage. HDR is self-explanatory. We'll do that for you. If we see multiple pictures of the same people uh, in burst mode, where they're not all smiling, we will find where they're smiling, and we will construct a new image with all of them smiling. It's amazing. <laughs> and uh, it could be kind and of. That would be useful for my kids, I know, because they always so want to make silly faces. Uh, an image, we recognize it's smiling, the same spot. We tell them to. We'll stitch them together. So assuming this is available to developers and they can put this in their own camera free. apps, what's going to okay, make the camera so apps stand out anymore if you can have today, all the same functions? Well, the, doesn't the HTC One do some of this stuff already? The motion stuff and the, the ability to swap people in and out? That's about design mm -hmm. and depth. So oh, sorry. That's, that's right. The S4. The one does some like little video. Yeah, the vignettes. We've shown you a new Hangouts application. Video vignettes and stuff. One that's about conversations that last with the people you love. And finally, we've shown you a new photos experience. And yeah, that was, isn't that a Galaxy S4 commercial Google with the graduation? Your dark room. And she swaps in the, the picture of her son because uh, we we he was flashing Google 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 everybody. Into Google Plus. And we That's kind of cool. Technology Leo in the chat room says, the end of search as we know it is coming. That's intriguing. Live, learn, and yes, even love. Thank you. It's the end of search as we know it. <laughs> Just... Okay. Now, now we'd like to talk about bored. what was possibly oh. your first Google love, search. Join me in welcoming Ahmed Single to the stage. Thank you. Go ahead, Ahmed. You talking? Little, uh, I think he's waiting for his prompter to go on. Little demo fail. That's his oh, teleprompter. they don't have there. prompter. This is natural stuff. It's a provocative title, indeed, especially coming from Google. But I believe with good reason. Search is dramatically changing right before our eyes. And in the next 15 minutes, I want to show you how and in fact, why? But before we dive in, let me just tell you why I'm so excited to be here. I grew up in small town India in the foothills of the Himalayas. Give it up, India. Wow. 
There's a billion Thank of you. them. Somebody should be it's cheering. A siren. <laughs> and yes, that's me when I was three. His skin has been softened when and has been auto-enhanced <laughs> as well. Indeed. He's been My given the awesome asked treatment. Me too. What happened? <laughs> Growing up, like many of you, I was hooked on Star Trek. I would watch endless episodes of Star Trek, captivated by the future technology it showed. I mean, a computer you can talk to, and it will answer everything you ask it. I dreamt of building that computer one day, and little did I know that I would grow up to become the person responsible for building my dream for the entire world. All you want to do is use it. Now you had to go build it. <laughs> now, at Google, we are building three experiences that are making <clears throat> huge advances towards building that dream. The search of future will need to answer, converse, and anticipate. And today, we have announcements across all these areas. So let's start with answers, and let me show you what we have been up to recently. Last year, when we launched the Knowledge Graph, it was a huge advance in search technology. Knowledge Graph enabled Google to move beyond keywords and understand real-world entities, unique people, places, and things, and the relationships between them. Knowledge Graph allowed us to answer questions we couldn't have answered before, like, what are the movies by J.J. Abrahams? Or, what's the release date of one of the most anticipated movies of the season? Now, we have been continuously improving the knowledge graph. With over 570 million entities and growing, the graph becomes more and more powerful each day. And today, I'm happy to announce that very soon, you would start getting important statistics powered by the knowledge graph. Now you can already find answers to questions like, what's the population of India? However, starting today, we would be anticipating your next question, which may very well be, how does it compare to the population of other countries? And not only will we give you the answer alongside the trend line, we will show you all that in comparison to China and the United States, the two countries whose uh, who are most often compared to India population. Search yeah. results page is looking a lot more like Google now, a lot yeah. more cards. Search results are falling further and further English down on the page. And right. It also has big impact for Google Glass, and today too. Mm -hmm. you know, we are adding all the stuff Polish. is starting to come together. Well, Jeff Jarvis and Leo both yes, saying it's Google friends. now coming to search. I think Turkish. we'll see an example of that in a second. Simplified Chinese and traditional Chinese <laughs> as new languages for the knowledge graph. And while we are incredibly excited about our progress here, we're just getting started. And we know we can do a whole lot better. Because sometimes the answer you're looking for is that song or that video that your friend may have sent you, or it's your upcoming flight or restaurant reservation. And you should be able to find those answers from your own world without having to dig and sift through your email, your documents, and your calendar. You should simply be able to ask Google for your upcoming flight. Or you get a little angry there. It's like, or gosh, darn your it. trip plans, even your restaurant reservations, or the package that's about to arrive. And even, of course, your vacation photos. Now, people who have opted into our Gmail search field trial are already enjoying this powerful experience. However, something that is as important as giving you the answers and giving them to you in the most natural way possible is so that you can pretty much ask Google like you would ask a friend and You're not by having now? to type keywords into a search box. This is why we have been working hard on technologies like Let's voice recognition converse. and natural language understanding. Where are those now, Google sneakers we have already launched conversational <laughs> search on Android and on iOS platform. 
You can tap the mic, ask Google your question, and you can get a spoken response back. And this today, up this morning, for actually. the first time, I'm happy to announce that all this goodness of conversational search would be coming to all your desktops and laptops through Chrome. That's cool. Yeah, there's a little microphone showed up for some people today. It's on mine, right in the search box. While you can already use the microphone in Chrome to search, we will be bringing conversational search and hot wording. Oh, that a was new good. interface, or as I call it, no interface. So that you don't even have to click the mic to search. You can sit back, relax, say, OK, Google. Poor man's glass. Mm -hmm. Ask your question and have Google speak back the answer. So we talked about the power of building these new powerful experiences to answer your questions and letting them ask you in the most natural way possible. However, we think that another essential experience is our ability to anticipate and suggest to you the right thing at the right time even before you ask for them. So Google's now your mom. Here, we're going to tell you exactly what to think before now. you think about it. All right. Google Now was launched for Android last year, and within a short amount of time, it has become a must-have for its users. Recently, we launched Google Now for iPhones and iPads through the Google Search app, and users are loving it. It's getting better and better by the day, and the more you use it, the more useful it becomes for you. And today, we are happy to announce that very soon, you would be able to set reminders for yourself in Google Now, and they would show up at the right place at the right time, whenever you need them. In addition, we are also launching public transit commute time cards and more cards for music, television, TV shows, and video games you are interested in. Yes. Dang, I like Google Now as a productivity tool. Yeah. That seems a little bit Yeah. Now, we're pushy. confident yeah. that all this momentum in Google away. Now yeah. will make Google even more useful as an assistive tool, and we are very excited about it. But as what long as we you are really what excited about is how all see. these experiences That's are a, coming together to make your life easy. I don't want I really don't want to know about And the best way books. to understand this is to actually see if them I can in action. choose not to see that card. I'd now like you know, to invite Johanna I'm just kind of right curious how it's going to tie into to uh, that all-access all Google Play thing where it's yeah. like, I've noticed you skipped to this song a million times. Right. You want a different artist. Right, right. It's an intriguing, uh, intriguing idea. Google now is getting more and more powerful. Well, and you, you have to use it consistently. I, it gets a lot of things Thank wrong you, for Amit. me. I'm so excited yes. to be here yeah, me to too. bring to life what Amit was talking about. Let's start with a scenario that might happen in my family. Plan planning a day trip to Santa Cruz with my husband and kids. I'm going to walk over to the computer here. And what you see here is a Chrome browser in full screen mode. And um, Amit was talking about hot wording. Now, this is really hot. We just Took it off the press this morning, and I've actually never tried hot wording in a room with so much ambient noise. Um, so no hands. OK, Google. Show me things to do in Santa Cruz. You are popular attractions in Santa Cruz. Wow, demo succeed. Nice. What you see here is coming from our knowledge graph. The knowledge graph knows that Santa Cruz is a place and that this list of places are related to Santa Cruz. I like the Natural Bridges State Beach. It's a nice place to relax with my family. But I kind of like something more active. What about the boardwalk? OK, Google, show me pictures of the Santa Cruz boardwalk. So Here you go. Yelp, Some pictures related out. to the Santa Cruz boardwalk. In the warm California sun. Nice. I love a wooden roller coaster, so does my husband. It'd be nice to see if our kids like it, too. The only question is, will the drive be too long? OK, Google, how far is it from here? 
The drive from your location mm. to Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk is 73.9 miles. Oh, you she can say, didn't it. say the location. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. That was my favorite search. And you know why? It's because I barely said anything. It here? Well, somehow Google knew that it was the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. And here is right here. Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. And here is right here. Now, the final thing that I'm going to need to prepare is where to eat. My kids love seafood. My daughter actually loves mussels. And it's, it's pretty funny to watch a four-year-old eating mussels. So why don't we try and find a seafood restaurant? OK, Google. Show me seafood restaurants in Santa Cruz. Here are addresses for seafood restaurants near Santa Cruz. Now, I've heard of this one, Johnny Harborside. I can click, look at the details, and even go ahead and make reservations right here. So there you have it. This is the latest voice experience coming to Chrome and Chrome OS. I just tried it on my Chrome and it didn't work, so I'm yeah. not sure if it's just not rolled out or what. Now let's fast forward to my trip to Santa Cruz. Here I am enjoying the beautiful weather with my kids. We're going on the kiddie rides. But you know what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about how I can get back to the Giant Dipper, that old wooden roller coaster. I don't know if my kids are tall enough to ride it. So we can walk over and check. Or wouldn't it be more convenient to just ask Google? How tall do you have to be to ride the Giant Dipper? You must be at least four feet, three inches tall to ride Giant Dipper. <laughs> That's only kind of awesome. I remember when I wasn't tall enough to ride the Giant nice. Dipper. <laughs> Looks like my son can go on. My, my daughter's too short, so my husband's going to have to wait this one out. So the next thing I'm going to have to check is will I have enough time to get to the Giant Dipper? Is will I have enough time to get to the Giant Dipper and get back in time for my reservation? Now, Google now anticipates my information needs. And Leo says so this will work today up, if you're signed up for Google the Gmail now, search field trial. I see the reservation right here. It's at 2 p.m., and it's only five minutes away. So now I know I can make it over to the, make it over to the roller coaster the in time. Gmail search and When I come back, trial. I can That's click on this Navigate link and get turn-by-turn -turn directions right to the restaurant. So now let's fast forward again. I've ridden the roller coaster. I'm in the restaurant. We're eating our mussels. And my husband and my conversation turns to an upcoming business trip I have to New York this week. Usually, on Wednesdays, I take my daughter to school. But I'm not sure if this Wednesday I'm going to have enough time to get her to school and then make it to the airport to get my flight. I don't quite remember when my flight is. So wouldn't it be great to just ask Google? When does my flight leave? Delta Airlines Flight 1940 from SFO to JFK leaves at 11.30 a.m. on May 22nd. Is he milking the applause there? For those of you participating in our search field trial, this will work today. Oh, she didn't say Gmail. She just said Now, the search. last time I was in New York, I was there with I my family. I wasn't there on business. I was there with my family to take them to see the sites. I saw some old friends. I had them meet my kids. And my friend Katie asked me to be sure to give her a call the next time I'm in town. Be sure that we can get together. So before I forget, why don't I get in touch with Katie? Send an email to Katie. I'll be in town on Thursday and was wondering if you're available for dinner. OK, sent. I've been using that more and more. Have you guys, been, have you guys used, do you use the spoken? The, the problem with Katie's that so far for me is the fact that my contacts so sure list is a mess. A right yeah. So it's trying to figure out who I'm sending things to. But mm. I've used it Remind for me to dictation call a lot. Yeah. yeah, I do too. More than I ever thought I would. It's just easier to say well, something. Here, and, and the accuracy has gotten good action. enough that Reminders it, yeah. launching I haven't had any today. problems with it, you know, picking up different Reminders words, except for names. Sometimes it fails on names, but. Including home and work. I find myself using it more and more. Yeah. Google now will remind me at just the right moment. It's a matter of trust, right? It's right. like once you start realizing again. it actually accurately Fly represents to New York, what you say. I get out of my plane. I go to get my taxi. In the past, what I would be doing is rifling through my backpack for the reservation so that I could tell the taxi driver where my hotel was. It does seem like Google she's waiting for nothing, right but apparently there's applause it. that you can't hear because there's no so audience. Point. Leo confirmed that earlier. I see my reservation at the W. I scroll down. I see my reminder to call Katie. So I've talked to the taxi driver. 
I've talked to my friend Katie. I'm just sitting back. I'm so excited to be back in New York, remembering the trip I had last year when I took my, friends, my kids around, when they met my friend Katie. I'd love to show Katie the pictures from this last trip. Now, for my final demo, wouldn't it be great if I could just ask Google, show me my pictures from New York last year. Oh, and those are my pictures from New York. We'll take your word surprise, for that. Surprise, surprise. That'd be so much more elegant if she had Google Glass on. <laughs> and there's Katie reading a book to my kids. This is awesome. These are the yeah, this is really blocks. impressive. I, mean, I think we're all just kind of stunned at this point. I hope you're starting to see how it's all coming together. With that, let's welcome Amit back on stage. That's what's really important that stock Android is on everything as well. Yeah. It's, if, it's, if you're using all the Gmail, all, all the Google applications, they talk to Android telling Thank you, you performing Google now I'm a lot more. I'm incredibly right. proud right. I mean, can you imagine just of the installing this in your home? And like, not just for home automation, but just to have to it there. It mm -hmm. You just speak like, like you were on Star Trek, right? Speaking like, computer, tell me this. Like, no matter where you are in your house. They're like, Nexus Q, do something though, cool. This experience <laughs> is rapidly <laughs> developing, and it will take some time before it becomes the predominant search experience. Also, I want this there always on in my car, complex and unsolved I've got a long commute. I can't always reach up and hit that the we will have to mm -hmm. solve microphone button. Before we get there, but our investment and commitment to getting there sooner rather than later is immense. You can say, okay, car. The I'm announcements right. today are anything, a really any, good any kind of keyword that it would recognize. progress we have made. With I'm more fine with saying, okay, Google, in the knowledge or anything. Graph and it's fine. More languages. I just want it on. I don't want to have to hit a button. Search and hot wording coming to Chrome on desktops and laptops, and new now functionality, including reminders and various other cards. This is better than search something like really Siri because it's cross-platform. But at the yeah. same time, your data set needs to be in Google. It's yeah. not going to find things that aren't Google properties. And assists you throughout the day across It's not like it's going to be pulling screens. Facebook pictures in. The right. idea of well, building such a powerful it would give you motivation to upload your things to Google Plus and Google yeah. searching everything for you. To the yeah, world absolutely. is what inspires us every day. And maybe to migrate With to Gmail from, touch of a mic, Outlook. from the Queen of Outlook. England. Yeah, I was about to say hot mail. <laughs> I was about to say hot mail, but that doesn't exist anymore. From the developer who just joined the Glass Explorer program to that mother Explorer. in a rural village in <laughs> India who just got her first basic smart Everyone can easily access all of humanity's information and get what they need to improve their and their families' lives. That, my friends, is the power of the new search experience that we are building at Google, and it will change how you and I experience this beautiful journey that we call life. Thank you. Is it the new property, Google Life? We can't use Life Ladies companion. and gentlemen. Samsung took that. <laughs> well, welcome to this thing we call and So we Life. have talked about the future of search and how it's changing right before our eyes. And we know that a perfect map of the world is foundational to delivering exactly what you want, when you want it, and where you want it. So I'd like to turn it over to Brian McLendon to talk about the future of Google Maps. So yeah, Maps is going to show you stuff next. Because <laughs> that they just blew away everybody. With that. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Brian McClendon, and I lead the uh, Maps team here at Google. Google Maps helps you navigate from place to place, but it also helps you explore and discover the world around you. Today, we're going to talk about the future of Google Maps and where it's going. But to talk about the future, I need to talk a little bit about the past. Back in 2005, Maps was a problematic experience on the internet. It was very slow, 10 to 20 seconds for a map, multiple boxes you had to type things into. Google Maps came up with the idea seconds. of pre-rendering the map tiles, providing that single search box, and making a smooth, fluid experience. And we launched, and many people were very excited about it. But Europeans had a bit of an issue, and they sent this screenshot. We had launched with only part of the world. And it shows that data is very important. We worked incredibly hard. And th by 2008, we had licensed data and had turn-by-turn -turn directions in 22 countries. But we discovered that keeping data up to date was very hard. We created a project called Ground Truth. Ground Truth is taking authoritative data sources, combining with all of the process and uh, 
algorithm to Google, and making the best data set we can possibly make. Recently, we launched two more countries, Thailand and Indonesia, bringing to a total of 43 countries overall with the ground truth data. But this doesn't cover the whole world. In many cases, countries didn't have good maps. We created a tool called MapMaker. MapMaker allows its users to contribute their data and make the best maps they can. In some cases, those maps are now the best maps that country has anywhere. And that's helped us cover 199 countries around the world. But there's one country that was missing. We had some of it in MapMaker, but just very recently, we published North Korea, making 200. Now, you can take a look at what North Korea looked like before. We just had you know, this river and the, and the um, city name. But adding all of the detail for Google, actually having people tell us the POIs, the places, the parks, the uh, neighborhoods, the streets, gives it so much more depth. And there's another thing you see on this map that was really important to us. Geocoded photos change the experience of everything. They allow you to dip into a place and really get a sense of the place exactly. And those geocoded photos inspired us. And in 2007, we launched a product called Street View, which actually created these big panoramas. And we launched it in seven cities in the United States. But those seven cities weren't enough. Recently, we launched two more countries, Hungary and Lesotho. And we now have 50 countries around the world covered with Street View imagery. We've driven 5 million miles with these cars. But we haven't just taken Street View on the road. We've taken it on trains up the Swiss Alps. We've taken it down the Amazon on a boat and even at a beautiful imagery from the Great Barrier Reef and other places around the ocean. And as they you can see in the here, Twit studios. this is an incredibly immersive experience. That actually is the Twit studio. That's in the back. So, <laughs> being able to go here, huh? you know, unless oh, you're yeah. a snor snorkel. We have a really snorkel, elaborate aquarium. I heard your you servers really were water-cooled. I didn't know the whole basement was. The tortoises are actually the administrators. And the place right. Oh. This is the imagination that created Google Earth in the first place. Imagery is very important to us and been working with satellite imagery and aerial imagery for a long time. But in 2012, we started generating new data from our existing aerial imagery. Combining oblique images, many different photographs from uh, around a building, we're actually able to generate 3D geometry of large urban cores, and we're now covering far more places with 3D buildings than we ever had before. This idea of generating data from other data is fundamental to what Google does. We have so many different sources of it, but there are also so many different kinds of errors you can have. We have the base map. This is leading to something. We have right? Street View drivers with GPS tracks of their cars. We have images from Street nah. View, satellite, no. aerial. Well, that's the what we did. Leo says if you fear Google, you should be very afraid. Each one of them is good, but they can know be improved everything. in combination. I hope they can combine this street view data to build 3D testing. models. And it's of incredibly humans important as well. to improving the quality of maps overall. You know, one of the best examples of this is our local business data. Locating local businesses precisely is actually pretty hard. But using Street View, yeah, especially when they're in a computer shopping vision, plaza. and algorithms, we have over 40 million precise geocodes locating these businesses around the world. Starbucks is here. Ours the most I still want it. it. I, I'm pushy with this kind of thing. Businesses. I want it to get better. I want it to be able so, to say, I want to buy athletic data, shoes and have just the places that sell running shoes, for yeah. instance, but it's also uh, show up. And it's not quite good enough to do that yet. In 2005, Google Maps API launched. But in the last year, we've had 30% year-over-year growth. And today, I'd like to announce we have over 1 million websites using Google Maps in their, in their site and improving their site. These, these sites are visited by over a billion people every week and actually get more use than Google Maps does on Google products alone. So Google Maps API is incredibly important to us, and it's thanks to people like you who've added their you know, Google Maps to the power of their charge. application. That's exactly what now, I was thinking. Obviously, applications are important to you, and you heard about Hugo in introducing the various mobile APIs for Android. And they have uh, really improved things with user location and the Android SDK for Maps v2. We also have Google Maps SDK for iOS. And being able to bring Google Maps 3D camera motion and fluid motion into your applications, I think, has changed a lot of the applications around and the uptake Can has been Apple incredible. sign up for that? I'd like to quickly introduce the 17 sessions that we're going to have in the Google Maps track over the next couple of days and highlight one thing in particular. There's a product called Google Maps Engine that you may have heard of, uploading your data into the cloud. If you can do that, you can serve your data to everybody with the same performance and quality and integrated with the Google Maps experience. And with the Google Maps API, you can actually have your applications read and write that data set and really change how things work. 
But now, I'd like to introduce Daniel Graff, who's going to talk about the next generation of Google Maps for mobile. Uh, here comes your iOS digs, iOS. Or they'll just say how they can make everything better. And so far, uh, Sundar was right. We have had no hardware talks whatsoever. Yeah. I was really anticipating oh, yeah, the a Samsung Nexus. Galaxy S4. That's the only oh, hardware. Well, that, but I mean, I was Nobody really anticipating a Nexus phones. announcement. Everyone in here you know, is probably here next for generation Android. of the Nexus 7 tablet but line. As most of you probably heard, last so far, December, nothing. we launched Google Maps on the iPhone. It has been a tremendous success. The feedback has been very positive. People called it sleek, simple, beautiful, and let's not forget, accurate. So, there's if the you're... Yeah. If you're an iPhone user, you don't have it on your phone yet, go to the App Store, download it today. Brian talked a lot about the power of Google Maps data. He mentioned we're going beyond just directions and navigation. Maps are also about exploring and discovering places. And nowhere is that more critical than on a mobile phone. Today, we're going to announce, we're going to give you a sneak preview of the next major release from Google Maps for mobile, coming to Android and, of course, iOS. For that, we're going to take a little stroll through San Francisco. I'm going to start here on my Nexus 4. And as you can see, when I start this, it's a brand new design, a new look. And actually, we are here at Moscone. I can zoom in. I can see all the beautiful 3D buildings, which we also saw in the Android demo before. But for now, as I mentioned, sometimes it's about what is the right place to go. So at the moment, let's say I'm in the mood for Burmese food. And here in San Francisco. So I'm just going to search for Burmese There's food. There's some good Burmese restaurants there. And when we look at the results, the first results we get is Burma Superstar has a 4.0 rating, over a thousand reviews. Well, I want to find out more. I actually see my friend Salahuddin, he rated it five stars. I trust his taste, so I want to look a little more. It's just swipe down, I have different imagery I can look at. Of course, once you go there, you can rate and review, you can upload photos. And as some of you, here I have different reviews I can a Google see. User. And some of you noticed a here, Google user. there's a rating scale of 4.0 there. So today, we're going to announce a new five-point rating scale across all Google Maps products. So if you search for a restaurant on Google.com, or if you use Maps on the desktop, or on a mobile phone. Now, I want to go to a different use case. And it's actually quite a common one. Does Zagat use five stars or four pizza? stars? Uh, 30 stars? 30, do, 30 points. It point. And it's Edition very confusing. District. Hmm. Well, and, he's, he's uh, about to get to the Zagat integration where we are. in a second. Let's see what results The five stars there. are for user reviews. And no surprise, we're getting a lot of results. And with this new UI, it's very easy to browse through it. I can just swipe to different results. I can bring up the, the details and look at, is this a good place to go? But something caught my eye here. It's the Zagat badge. What does that mean? And before we looked at user reviews and my friend's reviews, but sometimes you want to have a trusted opinion from an expert. We integrated a brand new Sagat experience. And as you know, Sagat is one of the most trusted brands to, on opinions about restaurants and places to it go. Is. Here you see That's a little card, and you yeah. see the Pizzeria Delfina is actually on a list called Restaurants Worth the Wait in San Francisco. I can also get all the details, such as the editorial review from Zagat and the Zagat scores. So sometimes it's important view from Zagat and the Zagat scores. So sometimes it's important to get a trusted expert to tell you, hey, this is a place you can go. Now, it has been a, quite a, a long morning, an exciting morning, but <laughs> I'm going to go back to where we are right now, around Moscone and downtown here in San Francisco. And what I'm going to look for is uh, I'm in a mood for some coffee. So I'm going to search for coffee. Cyclist. And let's see what the results are here. Four barrel? And beets. For example, well, first result, ah, surprise, surprise, there's a lot of Starbucks in town, has a high rating. And something else caught my eye here an offer. And let's have a look at it. And actually, we have integrated here a brand new offers experience with great deals from some of the world's best brands. In this example, this is Starbucks. And as we see, they're introducing a new drink, Starbucks refreshers this afternoon, half price off. Please don't run there. I'm giving you a preview here. 
And if we go in there, and I actually want to, I can get the details about the offer, and then I can save it for later as well. So we see here the offer Four about Foursquare it, competitor. I use it later, and then I can uh, go this afternoon if I want to. We have many launch partners beyond Starbucks. Probably as well as Groupon and some of the come. others. This is the new offers experience in Google Maps for mobile. So now but I want to talk a little catch bit up about here, directions. So. And a lot of Leo said this is a ways competitor he's about to uh, talk about. When I look at numbers, we have currently over a million transit stops in the whole world which we cover. And for those who are using cars or ride around with bicycles, 50 billion kilometers of turn by turn directions. Imagine 15 billion kilometers. Today we're going to announce several new key features uh, to make your navigation experience even better. For example, we have a revamped incident experience. We're adding live coverage of incidents from all around the world. So in traffic view, like for accidents? example, you can see in real time I think incident alerts. Yes. You can just tap on traffic it to accidents. see details. And then you know what's going on. So Even that's some cooler, Waze does that, right? Mm -hmm. is yeah. yeah, Waze also routes you around it. It knows where the heavy traffic your is. Route, yeah, and that's and cool. And something gets, happens ahead of you. The conditions uh -huh. worsen. Google gives you an early warning, and it tells you, hey, there's a better route to take. There you go. So there we go. Yep, cool. The next generation of Google Maps. Of course, we all do this smartphone. manually today, so this is cool and if they're going to do it automatically. Or at least I do. Was it automatically, or did it look like in the, in the demo you had to push a button? Yeah, you might have to push a button, but I mean, at least know, I don't have to sit there and look down at my I don't want to push a button while I'm driving, though. Right, I just want it to not just about reroute me automatically. Smartphones. Or, we go a little bigger? or have the option. give you Inside. an option um, so, audibly. I'm yeah. very happy right. to announce mm -hmm. as you're getting today, your turn by turn directions that we have a there's an accident up ahead. Take me on the new route. Yeah. Tablet map or, or, or there's an accident up ahead. Would you like me to reroute you? So we're still here in San Francisco. And you just say yes. yes. But Waze just does it, and I prefer that without any kind of interaction. Down, 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 and yeah. the, the, the big question cool. would be how good is it at doing this? Right, right. And on the tablet, they work vice versa on both platforms. Here we're at Macy's. We have indoors. We have tens of thousands of places in the world where you can see into the buildings and see what stores there are, what, what you can find and out And it's there, also in the voice of James Earl Jones. But sometimes you don't really know what you're in the mood for. You're like, entertain me, show me. What can I discover in San Francisco? I'm visiting here. What so can't you're you? not typing in a search query. All you do is, and this is a new experience, you say, let's explore. It's a beautiful explore experience. Or I'm like, wait, wait a see, second. I'm in the mood to Didn't eat we have something, explore? to drink, to shop. It's a little early to sleep right now, so I would say, let's play, let's get entertained. And when I go through this, I can go to museums, to public parks, and, uh, well, let's take uh, one. You That's great for traveling. Before. The Golden yeah. Gate Bridge, very high rating, 4.6. Another I Yelp or Foursquare competitor here, right there. And just yeah. at the touch of a button, you want to see how it looks like there. You have the street. Well, it's interesting, you know, and of course, it's very easy to there are people there saying, after. oh, Waze is worthless so now. Uh, Foursquare is done for. But, you know, historically, that's never really the case with these types of things. No. There you have it. So these were just a few. It all depends on how good they are at it, right? Maps and how, and right. what the interface is, how, how easy it is to use. And as I mentioned, we emphasize a lot on discovery, exploration, better navigation, and a beautiful new design. We're truly excited about this new product. It's coming to your Android devices and your iOS devices, smartphones and tablets this summer. It's pretty cool, right? But I could have used that yesterday. Thanks. But I tried to avoid some traffic go manually and Google took a Maps. different exit. Unfortunately, uh -huh. when, I, when I went off that exit, the street lights weren't working in that area of town. So I just caused myself way more headache. <clears throat> this would have rerouted and me around all, all that. Know, Google Maps has defined modern mapping. And there, yes. And we're about to reinvent it again. And for that, I want to introduce Bernie and Chona, and they're going to tell you a little bit Maybe more Maybe try uh, reloading it again, Chad. See if we can. Bernie, Chona. That's actually hard coded into the um, stream because on, I'm watching on three different computers, and those okay. breakups are coming from there. And would we Remember? catch up? Yeah, we, would we catch up a little bit? Yeah, we can try. Google Maps. We'll reload one of the other Imagine ones you're watching and switch to it. That same feeling again. We have been working on something that we believe does just that. We looked at what we have today and we saw there are three things and we saw there are three things missing. Number one, you and me and everybody else, we look at the exact same map. 
What, wouldn't it be awesome if you could build billions of maps, one for every user? And not only that, a map that adapts to what you do, a map built for you. And number two, Google has all this imagery from satellite to street, indoors, and even underwater. Moved here about Wouldn't a year it be ago. cool a nice if you could bring this all together time. into I one experience? New area. And I love exploring. And so one of the first things I did was search for restaurants. So and these are the new immersive new maps. Search experience. No They're very pretty looking. Hints. All the results are labeled directly on the map. This makes exploring really fast and easy. Good job, Chad. The top results, they come with a useful description that gives you a flavor of the place. So you can make decisions very quickly. No need for cross-referencing. Everything is right there on the map. The map is the user interface. Now, of course, there's this other way how you can find restaurants. You can ask your friends. And now you can do that directly in the new Google Maps. We added a filter. And now you see those search results are all the sushi places that my friends have reviewed. Like Ichi here that my friend Stephanie likes. And these are our new cards. They summarize everything that is important about this place. But earlier I was talking about imagery. And you saw, see those three photos? And I love this part. Let's take a closer look. Again, if your friends are using Google Plus and right. inside, this is great. That was yeah. a nice little zoom effect, wasn't it? We just, we just flew into our new immersive imagery experience. And it actually looks hungry. like a great place. So I might go there tonight. Something better than trying to drag that little man over from Street works. View and yeah. then go inside. Like, that yeah. seems a little silly. This seems this like a good yeah. uh, evolution of and I've done many, many uh, a combination of the U.S. I've better user places, interface. Start mm -hmm. places, and I make great new friends. Although was, that wasn't and Street View. That was an internal picture. Right. The places you see on this map, they are my landmarks. Like Francis here, that's a, one of the first places I went to. It's a great restaurant. I love it, and I keep going back. So it's very important to me. And just the other day, someone told me about a bike shop and said, it's right next to Francis. And I knew exactly where it is. It is a landmark for me. And that's why it's on my map. But it's a fairly small place. So it might not be on Jonah's map. It might not be on your map. But it's a landmark for me. And so it's on my map. And when you are logged in, you get your map. And we'll highlight everything that is important to you. Now, it's not just about all the places that I already know. A good friend of mine is in town for I.O., and I thought we could try a new restaurant. So is that kind of like bookmarks in Yelp? My map is going to help is me it, with just that. See these places the here? The kind of feature they're going for? I mean, more than just restaurants, yeah, obviously. But shows up because it's similar to Francis. I would think these things would be auto-generated by your own searches and things versus you being active. That's my question. Yeah, is it, it auto-generated, or do I, because my friend do I likes press it. something or say something so to make it look like great options. put the, put the uh, what do you call them? is how Google Maps helps you discover oh, these little new landmarks? places yeah, landmarks. without even having to search. So this we'll have to see. is how we can build a map for you. Or maybe it'll say, you've been here three times. Do so you want to make this a landmark? So it will get better and better the more you use it. Leo just switched on his Mophie, by the way. That's how, that's how much battery he had. So that's how we build a map for every person. Now let me show you how we build a map for every place. So next weekend, some friends of, from, <clears throat> some friends of mine from Italy are in town, and they have children. So I thought we could go to the Randall Museum. It's near my home, and it's really great for kids. But it's a little bit tricky to get to. See, this little road here that leads up to the museum, it's not even labeled. And that makes perfect sense. It's a very small, unimportant road but it's important for the Randall Museum. So watch what happens when we click on it. Now the street is labeled. And all the other streets that lead to this place are highlighted as well. That is kind of cool. I know Let's I've had to zoom in on maps to get the street names to show up. Before, yeah, I hate that. So I, I, I like this idea a lot. And yeah. After, the roads are highlighted and labeled. This map makes it so much easier nice to understand little iterative how to get feature. to this place. So we can build a unique map for every place on every click. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> ah, amazing gets thrown around a lot, but I'm impressed. I think on a day-to-day -day usage, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. Like, oh, OK, this actually works. Now, that's going yeah. to be really easy, because now all the landmarks you see on the map are related to the, landmark, to the Randall Museum, 
And so they're all about kids and museums. You can see the Cartoon Art Museum. You can see the Walt Disney Museum. And when we click on that, we get a whole new map with new places to explore. So we can click on the Exploratorium. And when we click on Exploratorium, another map appears. So we can keep going and going. This is a great way to explore new places. It's, <laughs> it's, it's really easy, just clicking and clicking. So it's simple and powerful. The map is the user interface. So now let's see how we can get there. So we could click here on directions. But for the most common case, there's an even simpler way. See, my home is right there on the map. And it says a 16-minute drive. So if I want to get directions from my home, I can just click on that. That's and great. this is our new directions experience. This, I, you know, he keeps saying it over and over like a catchphrase, but using the map as the UI, that's perfect. That's exactly what you always want to do. And the then you always have to figure out how that's to work around really that. That's going to be useful because this weekend we won't have a car. And we wanted to make public transit much, much, much smarter. Before, we showed you the next three departures. But now we are going to look at every departure, every second for the entire next week, and summarize that for you. So you can see here that you can take any of these lines, and they run every three minutes. So that That's makes nice. public transit so much easier. Usually just need to know what's happening now. So that you don't have to leave the interface and be right. brought to another That's site. And, and if you want more constantly details, get all this information in one. You can use uh, our new go to the BART site to schedule something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can just do it right from here. That's cool. That's, That's a good visual. Yeah, that is. So the kids, they don't want to walk too much. So I'm looking for a trip that has less walking and less transfers, even if it takes a bit longer. And here looks, that looks like a great one. So Leo this thinks this will put pressure on cities that don't allow directions. Google to have their traffic info, or their yeah. transit issue info. Now, as Brian talked about earlier, we've collected tons of imagery. And we made it a real focus of the design to make sure it's easy and fun to explore. So my friends, they're from Rome. And so they insist that next time I come and visit them. So let's take a trip. So this is a really nice 3D model of the St. Peter's Basilica. But can we have a more realistic view? Is this where we see everyone with Google Glass on now? No plugins, no downloads. This is the Google Earth experience right here on the browser. And that's not all. You see this row of images at the bottom? These are other great views of that area. That makes it really easy to explore. And the beauty of this place is really on the inside. So let's go on a tour. And you know what, Aaron? This kind of does fit in with some of the other things we're talking about, where they have this data before, but what they've done is figured out how to make it work better, and, you know, make it work more seamless, this is the a focus. Photo tour. That is on the product to show. Yeah. Yep. This is Microsoft PhotoSync. Photo it's like they've taken everything from Microsoft and they've just made it better. So this is the Moscone Center from a skydiver's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> but before the keynote started, I came up here on stage and with the camera up on my Android phone, I took a Photosphere and submitted it to Google Maps. And there it is. I love Photosphere. <laughs> Where's Leo? Where's Jeff? Where's Gina? This, this is how you guys look from up here. So everybody can upload a photosphere and submit it to Google Maps. And so it's like user-generated street view. We also took a photosphere out there on our geopod. And if you go there tomorrow morning, we'll have Oculus Rift, and you can get the experience you just saw with a leap motion. Oh, man. <laughs> Virtual reality. Let's get back out. Walk around the Google world. Now we have to go outside. So we jump back out. And as we're zooming out, and we're leaving the Earth's atmosphere. See, my idea for this was to do, for people to be able to world. do their own walking tours. I know there are apps that do that. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. you know, plug that into this. Let people record their own stuff and upload it through Google clouds? Plus or whatever. And then real create your own walking tour. Of course, it requires participation um, for the end user. Um, 
real-time view of the Earth. Well, isn't this what? exactly how... I mean, they've shown this to developers, and some developers are probably thinking, yeah, I'm going to do yeah. that as an app with right. the Maps API. With you've the got API. a lot of this power. And there are a couple this, that exist already, because I thought about developing it myself, and then didn't really want to compete with a couple other pretty good apps out there. The right position, and as That's the sun sets crazy. Behind the Earth, I love that. The night lights come out. Because it introduced this Google space travel. Excellent. Maps. Maps. Now, can I just can I do a route from there to Mars? I think so. Bernie, Jonah, the walking directions are going to be terrible. Now, when are we going to get this? How long is it going to take for you to deliver? I don't. Do, I don't think these people want to wait. Do you guys want to wait? <laughs> well, you can try this today. This is the new Google Maps. It brings the preview on the desktop. So it's the perfect thing to try with your new Pixel. Maps.google.com yeah, slash preview. Like, we're all typing. Yeah. <laughs> 404 error for me. So when you, when you pick it up, check your inbox. And me too. An invite. <laughs> and everybody else, please go to maps.google.com slash preview and sign up. And we'll send the first invites tomorrow morning. Yeah. That's Thank an you error. Very much, Bernie, Jonah, and Daniel. Some people got 503s. Some people got 404s. So that I got is 503s. the future of Google Maps. I got, got a 504. I got 527s. APIs, Those are my genes. What? Beautiful new Google Maps for mobile <laughs> coming in the summer. And a desktop maps coming to you in the room today. So with that, I'd like to thank the GEO team and all the people who've worked on this because it's been incredibly hard. But with that, the future of Google Maps. Thank you. And that is a nice big image behind him. That looks pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. I love that. It's that's amazing. Ridiculous. Of course, it looks amazing on that big screen, too. And here comes Larry. Oh, he's going to talk. Don't talk too much, Larry. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I thought that whole post about his voice thing was so to explain why he wasn't going to talk. Probably to explain the way why he sounds this way. Yeah. It was actually a while ago, I asked for a uh, picture of the Earth at night, and I'm really excited to finally have gotten it. Although I'm still waiting, actually, for a higher resolution. <laughs> <laughs> so let's give a big round of applause to the Maps guys. I think it's amazing. And if you're wondering what's up with his voice, he explained that in a Google I'm Plus really excited course. to be here. And first, I want to start with a story. I was very, very lucky growing up. And I was thinking about this as, as we were preparing for this uh, Google I.O. My dad was really interested in technology. And uh, I was just remembering, he actually drove me and my family all the way across the country to go to a robotics conference. And then we got there, and he thought it was so important that his young son go to the conference. And one of the few times I've seen him really argue with someone to get in someone underage successfully into the conference, and that was me. And one of the themes I just want to talk to you about is how important it is for uh, us all of the developers here in the room and watching to really focus on technology and get more people involved in it. And also thinking about my dad, his degree, he was lucky enough to get a degree in communication sciences. And you might ask, well, what the heck is communication sciences? That's what they called computer science when computers were passing fat. Sounds kind of funny now, right? Uh, but there was a time when that was true. And I think everyone today is excited about technology. You know, we don't have to worry about that so much anymore. But, and I think that Android and things like that are being adopted much faster than anything else in the past. You know, look at the rate of adoption of those things on almost any basis, they're much, much faster. And it's incredible. You know, I think about, you know, when I pull out my smartphone, it's amazing what we have in the smartphones. We have almost every sensor we've ever come up with. You know, I recently got a scale, 
and it measures air quality, you know, and it uploads it to the internet. I'm sure those things will end up in your smartphone, right? That's amazing. And, you know, your phone can talk to anyone in the world, almost anywhere in the world. And, you know, I was kind of remarking, I was talking to my teams about this. You take out your phone and hold it out, it's almost as big as a TV or a screen you're looking at. And it has the same resolution as well. And so if you're nearsighted, which I see many of you out there with glasses, and even some Google Glass, thank you. Um, I think many of you are nearsighted. You know, a smartphone and a big I keep thinking he's floating, but it's just because the background's moving behind amazing. him. <laughs> Those That's close funny. ups, I'm like, where he's is he? He's orbiting the doing? Earth, Aaron. He's levitating, what? So I think. We also have a lot more devices that we use interchangeably. You know, we use tablets, phones, laptops, and, you know, even the Google Glass. All those things we're using. And that's why we put so much focus on our platforms, on Android platforms, on Android and Chrome. It's really important in helping developers and Google build great user experiences across these different devices to have these platforms. And I'm tremendously excited about all the innovation that you're bringing to life. Technology should do the hard work so that people can get on with doing the things that make them happiest in life. Take search, for example. Perfect search engine, as Amit mentioned, is a Star Trek computer, right? and understand exactly what you meant and give you exactly what you wanted. And our knowledge graph, which you saw, really brings that a lot closer. I think Google Now, which Johanna just mentioned, gives you information without even having to ask. And it understands the context of what you talked about before. So you can use things like pronouns. It's amazing. Flight times, your boarding passes, directions, next appointment, all with no effort. You know, think about a really smart assistant doing all these things for you so you don't have to think about it. You saw how easy some of those experiences felt. And we're just getting started. The opportunities we have are tremendous. You know, we haven't seen this rate of change in computing for a long time. Probably not since the birth of personal computing. But when I think about it, I think we're all here because we share a deep sense of optimism for about the potential of technology to improve people's lives and, and the world as part of that. And I'm amazed every day I come to work, the list of things that needs to be done is longer than the day before. And the opportunity of those things is bigger than it was before. And because of that, I think we, as Google, and as an industry, all of you, we're really only at 1% of what's possible, and probably even less than that. And despite the faster change we have in the industry, we're still moving slow relative to the opportunities that we have. And some of that, I think, is due to the negativity you know, every story I read about Google, it's kind of us versus some other company or some stupid thing. And I just don't find that very interesting. Uh, we should be building great things that don't exist, right? It's a good sentiment to have. Anyway, being negative is not how we make progress. And most important things are not zero sum. There's a lot of opportunity out there. And we can make, use technology to make really new and really important things that make people's lives better. And if I think back to a long time ago, you know, a very long time ago, all of humanity was basically farming or hunting all the time, right? And you probably, if you lived at that time, you probably hoped that you could feed your family. And unfortunately, that's still true for a lot of people in the world. But certainly for us, we don't worry about that. 
And the reason for that is technology. We've improved how we raise, you know, grow food and so on. And the technology that has allowed people to focus on other things, if they choose. By the way, I think being a farmer is great if that's what you want to do. But it's not great if that's what you have to do. And that's what technology lets us do, is free up ourselves to do more different things. And I'm sure that people in the future will think we're just as crazy as we think everyone in the past was at having to do things like farming or hunting all the time. So to give an example of this, Sergey and I talk a lot about cars. You know, he's working on automated cars now. And imagine how self-driving cars will change our lives and the landscape. More green space, fewer parking lots, greater mobility, uh, fewer accidents, more freedom, fewer hours wasted behind the wheel of a car. And the average American probably spends almost 50 minutes, five zero minutes, commuting. Imagine if you got most of that time back to use for other things. And unfortunately, even in other countries, uh, commute times are still pretty large. Uh, not quite as large as the U.S., but still very significant. Now, to get there, we need more people. Uh, more people like you, more kids falling in love with science and math at school, more students graduated with science and engineering degrees, and more people working on important technological uh, problems. And it's why Google got involved with the movie the internship. I'm not sure we entirely had a choice, but they were making a movie. Uh, we decided it would be good to get involved. Lorraine's up front. Uh, she's really responsible for that. And I think the reason why we got involved in that is that computer science has a marketing problem. Uh, we're the nerdy curmudgeons. I don't know about you, but that's what I am. And, uh, well, in this movie, uh, the guy who plays that is Search, the Amit Singhal you just saw, is by far the coolest character in the movie. And we're really excited about that. So I think today, we're still just scratching the surface wow. of what's possible. You know, that's why I'm so excited. Google is really working on the platforms that support all of your innovations. You know, I cannot wait to see what comes next. You know, I got goosebumps as I was watching some of the presentations here. And I uh, really want to thank you for all of your contributions. So with that, I'm going to do something kind of unconventional and uh, try to take some questions, actually, from all of you. So I've got two microphones set up uh, towards the back here. And don't be shy. Line up and ask some questions. I'm sure some of you have thought of some good questions. And we'll get started. So thank you so much. Jeff Jarvis in our chat room uh, asking the question if Larry Page is taking on the mantle of Steve Jobs. Uh, yeah. Certainly getting that effect for a lot of people. Yep. I was thinking the same thing as he was talking. All right. So we got a few racing up. Please line up so we can get through them quickly. And we'll, one question per person, please. We Great speech, though. I mean, you don't you typically hear speeches like that at um, developer conferences. I'm right? going to call out the. Uh, one million people. And if you haven't read the Google Plus post, uh, Larry detailing his, his uh, struggle with vocal cord Let's paralysis that, that he's had since the founding of Google has just gotten worse over the years, hence his voice sounding like. Okay, yes, sir, on the left here. Um, I'm Robert Scoble, one of the first glass holes. So thank you. Yeah. Robert thank you for Scoble. Robert, uh, Robert, I really didn't appreciate the shower <sighs> picture, though. <laughs> you t uh, here at, at Google I.O., uh, several contextual things start coming out. We start seeing an API that's going to tell us whether we're walking or running or whatnot. Where are you going to take that in the future now that we have more sensors? And are you going to talk about the little sensor inside the Google Glass that watches our eye? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, this is a big area of focus. I think you saw that. Uh, in the presentations. I think really being able to get computers out of the way and really focused on what people really need. Uh, mobile's been a great 
uh, learning experience, I think, for us and for all of you. You know, the smaller screens, you can't have all this clutter. I think you saw on the new Google Maps how we got all sorts of stuff out of the way. You know, there's like 100 times less things on the screen uh, than there was before. And I think that's going to happen with all of your devices. They're going to understand the context. You know, just before I came on stage, I had to turn off all of my phones, right? And so I'm not interrupting all of you. That's crazy. You know, that's not a very hard thing to figure out. So all that context that's in your life, all these different sensors are going to help pick that up and just make your life better. And I think that we're, again, only at the very, very early stages of that. It's very, very exciting. All right, let's take another question. Yes. Uh, hello, Larry. Uh, my name is Daniel Buckner. I have the uh, opportunity to work at Mozilla on a lot of the web technologies with you guys here at Google. And I just, you know, I saw a lot of the great web technologies you had here on display. And I know people had this question leading up to Google I.O., but are we ever going to see the web up-leveled in Android or subsume what is there now to be the operating system of mobile and your platform? Sorry, you're asking about the future of the web. Yeah, are we going to see it? I mean, Android right now it runs on Java. It's a native platform. It's great in a lot of ways. Uh, are we going to see the web and all the fantastic technologies you showed off here today be the center of that? Well, I think, you know, we've been really excited about the web, obviously being birthed from it uh, as a company. And I think that, uh, and we've really invested a lot in the open standards behind all that. You know, I've personally been quite sad, standards behind all that. You know, I've personally been quite sad at the industry's behavior around all these things. Um, if you just take something as simple as instant messaging, uh, you know, we've kind of had an offer forever that will interoperate on instant messaging. You know, I think just this week, Microsoft took advantage of that by interoperating with us, but not doing the reverse, you know, which is really sad, right? Um, and that's not the way to make progress. He's and referring to Outlook.com integrating GTalk. People milking off one company for their own benefit. So I think Google has always stood for that. I've been sad that the industry hasn't been able to advance those things, I think, generally because of a focus on negativity. That's weird. Didn't Google get in a lot of trouble for scraping games. data from everybody else? Right, um, right. So I hope we, you know, we try to be on the right side of all those things. We also try to be practical and look at what other people are doing and not just rely on our principles uh, to shoot ourselves in the foot and our users in the process. So, you know, I don't know how to deal with all those things. I'm sad. Uh, that the web's probably not advancing as fast as it should be. We certainly struggle with people like Microsoft. We've had a great relationship with Mozilla, I think, and, and value that deeply. Um, I'd like to see more open standards, more people getting behind things that just work, uh, and more companies involved in those ecosystems. I think that's why this conference is so important. Um, but I don't. I wouldn't grade the industry well in terms of where we've gotten to. In the very long term, I don't think you should have to think about, as a developer, you know, am I developing for this platform or another or something like that? I think you should be able to work at a much higher level. And software you write should run everywhere easily. Uh, Sounds like Java. People like Mozilla yeah. should be able to add meaningfully to that. Uh, and make platforms and other things. So that's how I would think about it. That was the and original vision very, for Java as well. That's an important question, though. Yes, 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 ma'am. Hi, uh, I'm from Colombia. And the only reason, because I didn't quite uh, to finish my law studies, was thanks to Google. So I have dreamed in this question uh, many times. And I would like to ask you um, how Google will uh, let us protect our freedom of speech through internet? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think we, yeah. I mean, this is part of the area where business gets interesting, right? I think we, uh, Google, pretty clearly have a, a strong desire for freedom of speech 
for a free flow of information. And one of the main things we do is probably translate that into practice, you know, in hundred, hundreds of countries around the world and make sure we're talking to government leaders and making sure we're helping advance that. And our chairman, uh, Eric Schmidt, has been kind of traveling the world talking about that and you know, I really applaud those efforts and, and thinking about that. Uh, so we're working very hard on that, making sure we're protecting your private information, uh, making sure that we're uh, ensuring computer security, which is required uh, to make sure we're protecting your freedom for that. And uh, making sure we're being as transparent as we can about the requests we get from government and things like that. So this is a big area of focus for us. And uh, hopefully we can do a lot to help the world and, and move it along there. It's a very difficult and important issue also. Yes, other great questions. Recently, Google Fiber was announced for there. And part of the marketing campaign is Questioners 100 from times Provo. the speed, 100 times the possibilities. What, what do you see as the possibilities from that fast of internet? Well, I mean, I think from an engineering point of view, it's just kind of a no-brainer. Like, uh, I mean, we got started building data centers, and, you know, uh, one of the biggest problems we have was network even in the data centers. And so, I guess as a computer scientist, I just view it's kind of sad. We have all these computers out there, and they're connected to each other through, like, a tiny, 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 tiny little pipe. Uh, that's super slow. And so in a sense, all the computers we have in the world, most of them are in people's houses. Most of them can't be used for anything useful. So, you know, it's obviously ways to go from where we are now. We don't really have software that's designed to use those things yet. But we know if we build that capacity, uh, we'll be able to use those computers for all sorts of interesting things. And you know, even basic things like the bandwidth of your visual system, it's pretty high compared to the bandwidth most people have. And I think it's pretty clear we want to deliver bits to your eyes, <laughs> just as a basic thing. So um, I'm really excited about what we'll be able to do and what you'll all be able to do uh, as we get more people with super high speed connections. And uh, probably gigabits are just the beginning for that. Uh, what we really need are low latency connections that operate. Google wants to do things, and they have the cash to just go and make the world work the way they want. What do you say? I'm really excited about that. Yes. A black uh, shirt hi. there. I'm Yaniv Talmor from Vancouver. We've seen Google move into some physical, real world products like uh, Google Fiber and the autonomous self driving cars and their renewable renewable energy cheaper than coal initiatives. I'm curious if you can elaborate on further projects that Google is planning to get into regarding physical world type initiatives. Yeah, um, well my compatriot Sergey Brin, uh, the, who last year arranged the skydiving, but this year did not. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's focused, uh, Google X is focused on real sort of atoms and not bits. and. Uh, Part of why they just feel there's a lot of opportunity there. And, you know, Sergey's having a great time doing that. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, I think, a really, really fascinating and amazing job. I think that possibilities for some of those things are, you know, incredibly great. Uh, technology, if you look at technology applied to transportation, hasn't really started yet. You know, we're, we haven't really done that yet. So I think. And automated cars are just one thing you could do. You can do many, many other things. So I think we're very excited about that area. And we also think it's a way that the company can scale. Um, I think that to the extent all of our products are interrelated, um, we actually need to do a fair amount of management of those projects to make sure you get a seamless experience, both as a user and a developer, that it all makes sense. Again, the integration uh, theme we, we talked about other before. Kinds of things like automated cars, they have a longer time frame and less interaction. And so I'd actually encourage maybe more companies 
to try to do things that are a little bit outside their comfort zone, because I think it gets them more scalability in what they can get done. And uh, so I think we've been surprised also, even when we do things that are kind of crazy, like the automated cars, it turns out you just saw the mapping stuff we finished with. The technology for doing mapping in automated cars turns out to be the same. And so we have a bunch of great engineers that just moved over from those efforts, and they did it naturally and scalably. So I, and they're excited about it. And so I'm really, really excited about that, too. So every time we've done something crazy, uh, Gmail, when we launched it, I think we had 100 people in the company when we launched Gmail. And people said, you're nuts. You're a search company. Why are you doing Gmail? It's because we understood things about data centers and surfing and storage that we applied to email. And that was a great thing we did that. And so I think almost every time we've tried to do something crazy, we've made progress. Not all the times, but almost every time. By the so way, a lot of people are reporting that the new Google Plus uh, and the interface is, too, is rolling out no matter how much as we speak. We I haven't seen it yet, but Jason Howell said he's got the new cars, interface up on his uh, desktop. Stages. So they end up being small. If you're interested, start refreshing so your browser. Really see, see if you get refresh it. my maps preview. I'm not yeah, me that. too. I'm really excited about that. I try to talk about that in my remarks. I did get updates so on my uh, Android phone as well for Google Search possible. and um, uh, yeah, Google Music. Uh, hi, Larry. So uh, it's Greg with DCI seems like things are working out, are rolling uh, we're out. We're developing apps for Google Glass. And uh, I was really excited to see the all the new things that Google is providing, uh, uh, and also realized <laughs> that it kind of trounced a bunch of existing businesses. They're having the guts to say what we're all thinking. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> what you feel are the largest area of opportunities uh, for developing on Glass outside of what Google will provide naturally? Did they actually announce Android 4.3? Uh, and the bonus question, something entirely. No. Uh, what right. will be the production run for Glass for consumers? So I keep waiting uh, to see I mean, if there's I anything. Sure is is there going to be something after this? Usually uh, not, but... Unless you're Steve Jobs. So I don't know what the production numbers will be. I think but there's one last Vermont thing, so I don't know. With Glass. Glass is a new category. Maybe we can just ask Google. Quite different. Here's the new try than, uh, Google Play Music devices. All Access. And so I think when it's I great that my, we started on it. Google Music app. But I think our try main it free. goal is to get I will. happy users using Glass. And so we put uh, you know, a bunch out to developers. I see a lot of people with them in the audience. We want to make sure we're building experiences that really make people happy. And so the team has tried to build the minimal set of things. You do have to agree to the subscription, by the way, when you uh, try it for free, so you can back out. Will if provide you want, but you still have to sign up for the subscription make first. Happy users. And then you know, we can get going and work on it for the next 10 years. And you know, every successive one is going to be better, obviously. So I think um, part of the answer is we don't know. You know, I think the Basic use cases we have around photography are amazing. I love taking kids of my pictures of my kids uh, with glass uh, and movies and so on. And I find that, you know, for me, that's enough. I have the young kids. For me, that's enough reason to have glass uh, just there. Uh, I think if you didn't have young kids, you might not feel exactly that way. I'm not sure. I, didn't, I have young kids, so mm -hmm. can't tell. Um, Call me heartless. Communications <laughs> are also pretty amazing. Navigation is amazing. Certainly if you're walking, you know, if you're in Manhattan or something, having glass for navigation is unbelievable. Um, I find it's really, really nice. And I also find that uh, so navigation is amazing. Some of the core experiences we have, I think, are pretty amazing. Uh, communications, phone calls, SMSs, voice. You saw the things we're doing around voice. It's amazing to always have the device there to do that. So I think ultimately a lot of your experiences can move to glass. And we're relying on all of you to figure all that out. We're trying to get the base thing to make happy users so we can get on with it. We're aligned with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yes, over here. Hi, uh, my name is Caleb Allen. Um, and I was wondering what advice you would give to the rising generation of technologists? Um, what would help technology keep moving at the pace it's been moving at for the last five or 10 years? And how would they do that responsibly? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think for me, uh, actually try to use Google a lot and I research things really deeply. So, you know, before we get something started, I try to actually understand it. And I think, and not just really understand it, like understand the crazy people in the area. And Google's great for that. You can find the craziest person in any given area. Um, so, and I think normally people do not do that. So I think you want to think about, you know, the base thing, you know, uh, whatever it is, you know, even obviously working on smartphones a lot, they're relatively expensive now. Uh, and with Nexus 4, we tried to improve that a bit. But, you know, if you look at the raw material cost of a smartphone, you know, I guess it's mostly glass and silicon, tiny bit of silicon, a little bit of fiberglass. I don't know, the raw materials cost of it's probably like a dollar, you know, or something like that. Uh, I think glass is 50 cents a pound or something like that. Uh, I don't know, metals are 20 cents a pound. Uh, oh phones don't weigh very much, right? So, and uh, silicon is very, very cheap. It's from the knowledge graph, so I think. I think. Uh, when I see people in industries like are making things, I ask this question, like, how far are you off the raw materials cost? And they never know the answer to that question. Uh, so I think kind of as an engineer, or as a technologist, trying to go to first principles and say, you know, what is the real issue? Uh, you know, what is the real issue around our power grids or what's the real issue around manufacturing or whatever it is? I think people usually don't answer those questions. And as a result, most of the work that's done is very incremental. And we don't, because of that, uh, we don't make the progress we need to. That said, I mean, it's very hard. If you're gonna make a smartphone for a dollar, one dollar, I mean, that's obviously like almost impossible uh, to do. But I think, you know, if you took a 50 year time frame or something like that, you took a longer view, uh, you'd probably start to make the investments you needed to. And along the way, you probably figure out how to make money. So, you know, I just kind of encourage non-incremental thinking and a real deep understanding of whatever you're doing. That's, that's what I try to do. Yeah, all the way over on the right, and I'll make another pass. I, I have a question about the future of Android. So with Oracle taking control of Java from 7 forward, uh, how does Google advance Android when one of the core technical underpinnings is not necessarily in its control? Yeah, I mean, I think we've had a difficult relationship with Oracle. Uh, <laughs> I guess including having to appear in court, you know, as a result of it. So I think, uh, again, I think, you know, we'd like to have a cooperative relationship with them that doesn't, hasn't seemed possible. Uh, and I think, again, probably money is more important than, to them than having uh, any kind of uh, collaboration or things like that. So I think that's been very difficult. Uh, I think we'll get through that. And I think obviously Android's very, very important to the Java ecosystem. And so we'll get through that just fine. Uh, just not in an ideal way. Yeah, another question. Hi, my name is Prashant. I'm an Android developer from India. I'm a heavy Google user. Most of my opinion, actually, I can trace back to a Google search. And as your search, as we saw today, it become more and more personalized. The guy and with the Android hat. I kind of worry that it kind of enforce my worldview and kind of rule out the possibility of some serendipitous discovery of other side, you know? So any comment on that? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. People have a lot of concern about that. I'm totally not worried about that at all. Um, <laughs> and it uh, sounds kind of funny to say, but uh, that's totally under your control, and, and our control is cool. So I think, I think it's very important to have a you know, kind of wide worldview, to have education, all those kind of things. But the right solution to that is not randomness, right? So you can't really argue doing a bad job of returning whatever you wanted is the right way to educate you. It's just not. Uh, it would be better to return exactly what you wanted when you wanted 
and use that saved time to have you read the news or read uh, textbooks or books or other things that might be more general. So I think you know, we can put that into the algorithms. So I think, you know, I guess in my very long-term worldview, you know, 50 years from now or something, hopefully our software understands deeply, you know, what you're knowledgeable about, what you're not, and how to organize the world so that the world can solve important problems. You know, people are starving in the world, not because we don't have enough food, it's because we're not organized to solve that problem. And our computers aren't helping us do that. So I think if you think about it that way, you think about we need to make computer software and the internet that helps people solve important problems in the world. That will cause, as a side effect, for people to be educated about the things they should get educated about. And that's not the same as a demand. I'm asking for a particular thing I'm searching for. Those are different modes. You just kind of make sure we're serving both modes and that computers can help you do that. So I'm, I could not be more optimistic about that. Uh, I think computers and software and things that you all write uh, and we all write are going to help us solve those problems for people uh, rather than just doing it at random. So, all right, next question. Hi, Larry. I'm Asman from uh, GDG Lead Brunei. Uh, it's great that uh, Google has uh, developed a lot of new technologies and allow us to live in a better way that we are today. Uh, my question is not about technology. It's just a basic question for the developers and the countries that I came from in the Far East. Uh, we developers have been developing trying to develop applications, but one of the main issue for us in many of the GDGs is that we can't sell this one part. The other thing is that I have been asked many times that why can't we buy paid apps? That's my simple question. I hope uh, it's a great opportunity to voice this, this one out to you, and I hope things can be done because I don't see any reason why because People want to buy, and they can use their credit cards. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, that's an area we've had huge focus on. So I think we've made a lot of progress. Um, I think we'll make a lot more progress, but hopefully that's a very temporary problem, and we get through that quickly. But thanks for bringing it up. Uh, yes. Hi. My name is Kevin Nielsen from New Jersey, and I was intrigued about your comment about the positivity and the negativity and I'm very interested in helping other people be positive about technology as you are and I'm interested in what your advice would be to help us sort of reduce the negativity and focus on positive and focus on changing the world. Well, circle around and sing Kumbaya. Yeah. yeah. These are kids, right? Yes. Okay, because sometimes I, I'm getting older and sometimes I have trouble figuring if these um, are, if they just yeah, look young really to be, question. or if they actually are young. I think people um, naturally do they have are concerned a, about change. A lot of kids, like, do they have a young developers program kind of, going on or something? You know, is think, that why these guys are here, or do they I just have... the face of change in the world is increasing. I think a lot of developers but, um, just are young. Part of well, that's, I, I guess that's my question, is, because we've seen at least two questions asked by folks that seem to be high school age. Um, isn't, isn't the IO thing that you have to be accompanied by somebody that's over 18, but that... You, you like can be so on, aren't keeping you up with the can be a kid and come to IO. I think it was that way last year through technology. I mean, I think it's great that they're there, uh, though. I mean, fantastic. But yeah, for sure. Um, you know, like I was just wondering if they had a special maker, program, like maybe for young developers. That would be kind of I mean, cool. The when we went public, we're 50 years old. It could be what like Google Summer of Code. Well, it maybe can't be right if it's 50 years old, like it's before the internet. It's like that's a pretty major change uh, in how you might go public. So. I think we need to, maybe some of you, or maybe the million people watching who love technology, maybe more of us need to go into other areas and help those areas improve and understand technology. And I think that's not happened at the rate it needs to happen. Yeah, thank you. And um, the other thing in my mind is we also haven't, uh, we haven't, uh, maybe built mechanisms to allow experimentation. Uh, there's many, many 
exciting and important things you could do that you just can't do because they're illegal and they're not allowed by regulation. And that makes sense. We, we don't want our world to change too fast. But maybe we should set aside a small part of the world. You know, I like going to Burning Man, for example. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure many of you have been to. Naked, yeah. but with Google Glass. Uh, what? Wait, tell us more about that. Um, well, so get uh, for that people uh, can try in depth photography, things. you know. And not everybody has to go. And I think so that's a great thing, too. I think as technologists, we should have some safe places where we can try out some new things and figure out what is the effect on society, uh, what's the effect on people, without having to deploy it kind of into the normal world. And people who like those kinds of things can go there and, and experience that. And we don't have mechanisms for that. So those are the kind of things I would think about. Um, I also think we need to be honest, and we don't always know the impact of changes, and we should be humble about that. You know, I'm not sure getting up on stage and saying, everything is amazing, uh, and so on is the right thing. Maybe we should launch things a little more humble way and see what the effect is and adapt as we go. Uh, so that's, those are kind of my what the effect is and adapt as we go. Uh, so that's, those are kind of my thoughts. So I think, yeah, way on the side well, here. I think, uh, Larry, Ben Schachter at Macquarie, healthcare impacts the society in so many profound ways and impacts the economy. What are the strengths that, uh, of Google that you can bring to help improve healthcare? Yeah, I mean, that's a great maybe segue from the previous question. I think it's been difficult. Uh, you know, we had Google Health. Uh, we didn't make much progress on it. And I think primarily we found that all the issues were regulatory. And it's just very hard to get technological leverage there. So when I was talking about we're 1% of where we can be, that's by doing real amazing technological things. And, you know, we found certainly in the kinds of things we were working on in healthcare, we weren't able to move beyond that <laughs> uh, due to all the kind of constraints that we were under. And so I think we'll see amazing things in healthcare, but I think there'll be things that have technological leverage like DNA sequencing. You know, we're clearly all going to have that. It's going to cost a dollar or whatever. You're all going to have your sequence and something amazing will happen. You know, I was, you know, I just disclosed yesterday my voice issues. I got so many great emails from people and thoughtful advice. And I realized, you know, you know, I had kind of notion like the stuff should be very private. I know, at least in my case, I feel I should have done it sooner. Um, and I'm not sure that the answer is not true for most people. So I asked, like, why are people so focused on keeping your medical history private? The answer is probably insurance. You're very worried that you're going to be denied insurance. That makes no sense. So that they have to insure people. I mean, the whole point of insurance is it insures everyone. So, so again, you know, maybe we have a safe place where people can go and live in a world like that, uh, where they make those kind of changes. We can see if they work, and then the world can learn from that and move on. But not everybody has to participate in that. So I'm worried we're not making some of the fundamental changes we need to make fast enough. All right, maybe one or two more questions. We're going to run out of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, John Saragardi with Form and Reform, one of the Burning Man artists you invited here tonight for the, uh, the after party. Thank you. Oh, great. My question, I, I'm very inspired to see that you've reached out to the e educational aspect. I have a six-year-old. Um, glad to see that Google's uh, moving that direction. My question is about uh, women in the development community. I'm looking around, and I don't see a lot here, and I'd like to know what we can do to encourage women to be here. It's a simple question. Yeah, I mean, that, we've been super focused on that forever. I think uh, Sergey and I, when we were interviewing people, we spent a lot of time interviewing women for that reason, uh, trying to make sure our company didn't end up all male, which I think is really, really a bad thing. So I think, like, ultimately, the only answer is we have to start early 
and make sure we're getting more young, young women and girls really excited about technology. And I think if we do that, there's no question we'll more than double the rate of progress uh, we have in the technology world. So we all need to do that, and we're trying to help with that in any way we can. And thank you for the question. Thank you. Yeah. All right, one more question. Uh, you had uh, Jeffrey Sika with the University of Michigan. While you had mentioned that um, regulation is usually the biggest problem trying to get technology into healthcare, I'm curious if you're going to be doing anything with DNA sequencing, considering you actually have all the horsepower behind it, and also image analysis with things like surgical slides and whatnot, because it seems like that's a really big area that we could get into to help people as a whole. Yeah, no, I think those are good questions. I don't have anything to announce at the time, but we always look uh, at these areas, but I think you know, we have felt it's a difficult area for us to work in. I think it's certainly worth doing, though. All right, let's take one more. Yes. Uh, I'm Josh Constein from TechCrunch. Could you discuss Google's plan for bringing the developing world online and what you see as the social, cultural, and political impacts of democratized access to the internet? Oh, that's a really great question. And one of the things I always talk about in the company, when I talk to the company, is that smartphones are going to basically be amazing in these places. And so you don't quite uh, have smartphones, for example, going into India or Africa because they're just too expensive. Uh, the average cost of a phone in India is, is very, very cheap. I don't know, $50 or $100 or less. I think more like $50. And I think that you know, we need to make sure that the prices of what we all are using quickly make it down to those levels, and I think they will. You know, that'll be the smartphone you have today, two or three years from now, will be in Africa uh, and India. And that will be amazing. Because I find, you know, I try to mostly use smartphones now. I find, you know, I try to mostly use smartphones now uh, just to make sure I'm living that future. I find I can get almost everything I need done. You know, and unfortunately, I don't get to program that much, but. You know, I can do most things I need to do uh, to run the company on my phone. So I think that's pretty amazing uh, to think that that can go to 3 billion, 4 billion, 5 billion, 6, that can go to 3 billion, 4 billion, 5 billion, 6 billion, 7 billion plus in not very long period of time. And uh, I think we're, we're probably, people are underestimating how fast that's going to happen. You know, I think it's clearly going to happen very, very quickly. And I'm really, really excited about that. We're trying to help that happen quicker. Uh, but I'm very excited about that. So thank you all for so much for spending so much time. Thank you. You're welcome, Larry. And that's it. Thanks, everyone. Who hung Great around with sessions. us. Very quickly before we uh, wrap up, just round the horn. They're going to they're break all this down on This Week in Google. So if you're watching live, hang out for that later on this afternoon. Or just if you're on demand, get it on demand or either one. Uh, Sarah Lang, quick thoughts. Um, I am <laughs> refreshing my Google Plus page every two seconds, trying to get the new look. Um, I'm excited about that. Um, I'm really excited to try out this uh, music service, especially because I, I really am interested in music subscription services. The map stuff looks very interesting. Currently, I mean, I'm I'm very loyal to Foursquare these days as far as recommendations go. Um, and I've always felt like Google could do a lot more in that arena. So I, I love the idea of social recommendations um, coming from Google just because they have such rich data as far as locations, um, you know, in the maps part of it anyway. So, in general, I thought, although this was an extremely long keynote, I mean, we were covering it for basically three and a half hours, um, there was a lot of really good information there. It started out as a developer-focused uh, keynote. It, it did go into more consumer end products at the end. Aaron Newcomb, you're a developer. What did you make of this? Yeah, I thought the, it was an interesting mix between developer and uh, consumer, right? So they kept going back and forth with this and they would bring out new features, new things for APIs. And then all of a sudden they would talk about all this new, new stuff coming to uh, Google Plus. 
without talking about a Google Plus API. So it's like, oh, look at all these great new features. Um, I think the Hangout thing looks really cool. A little disappointed that they didn't have any hardware announcements at all, uh, except for the Galaxy S4, which leaked out last night, um, which is really cool. So I guess I'll be maybe waiting until the end of June to, to pick up my next phone. But um, all in all, there was a lot of really cool stuff here. I do like the fact that, you know, People were getting kind of bored at the end with with Larry, I think, at least in the chat room. But I do think it was really important for him to get up on stage and talk to people and, and take those questions. I mean, you don't see that happen very often. And, uh, you know, Steve, I don't think Steve Jobs ever really took questions, did he, in any of his keynotes that I can remember. He, did after when he the first keynotes. came back. Uh, Curtis B. reminded me of this in the chat room. When he very first came back at WWDC, he did something very similar. Yeah. So, but he didn't do it very often. And I, I think it's really good for the, especially someone like Larry to get up and say, look, here's what we're working on. Here's what we're interested in. I think, again, um, I hate to brag, but I think that the the theme here was unification. And even Larry talked about, we're trying to bring these things together, all these different projects to work together and work better for the consumer. And also to um, enable developers to be able to take advantage of those. And uh, so I, I think that was really key. I think they're on the right track from a company perspective. I really like to see the direction that Google is going. And, and all of the features that they talked about were pretty cool. We, we were just playing, uh, Ayaz and I were just playing uh, the Go Racer, the Google Racer thing. I mean, even oh, yeah. that is, it is so amazing. You don't even realize while you're playing it, these are two separate devices and this is running in the browser and you're controlling a car that's going in between the two devices. I mean, it's just completely mind boggling. Simple little game, but it's mind-boggling to realize that this is all happening, you know, uh, live across two devices, two, you know, in the all in the browser. It's just crazy. No Nexus 7, no Android 4.3. Uh, I as Sundar Pichai tried to set our expectations that this they weren't going to have a lot of big product announcements or operating system announcements, and and he delivered. What did you think of this? Um, I think uh, what I was actually most pleased with in the whole in the whole uh, presentation was the modifications to search. I mean, that's what I use Google for anyway. The fact is that it can uh, pick up pronouns now and you're using voice search, using the OK Google command, and it becoming more and more intelligent as you use uh, Google searches and other properties. That's really becoming a killer personal assistant kind of situation with all of, all of these applications talking to Google now and you have all this information at the right time. I think that's going to make a really big difference because it's going to cause you to potentially change your behavior to constantly use these services so you get more and more information and that's going to help out everywhere. I'm also very curious about how Hangouts is going to work if it's really mm -hmm. unifying everything because I don't believe Google said anything about uh, talk being uh, put away or voice or any of the other communication methods. Hangouts is just a refreshed version. I want to know more about it. Yeah, they did add that there's a Hangout um, plugin for Chrome. Uh, the new Hangout feature is available in Chrome via a plugin. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to download it there, you can check it out right now. Summary of what they announced, and I promise to take less than three and a half hours. Uh, activity recognition can tell if you're walking, driving, or cycling. Uh, Google Play game services, cloud saving, achievements, leaderboards, multiplayer, launching on iOS and the web, as well as Android, so cross-platform. Android Studio, which Leo called a Google wave for developers in the chat room. Uh, a new developer console that uh, we won't go into in detail right now, but really great stuff if you're a developer very exciting stuff both aaron and gina were very excited by a lot of the things they announced there google play music all access google's music subscription service uh ten dollars a month uh, but they're launching with a 30-day free trial and then you can get it for eight dollars a month after that if you do the free trial as we mentioned stock android on the samsung galaxy s4 coming to t-mobile and at&t with lte support 649 dollars on june 26th uh also the google plus hangout app a uh, new standalone app for web, iOS, and Android coming today. A lot of new Google Plus things, including a new stream, new way of handling photos, some photo editing abilities, and Google Search, as I has mentioned, uh, the ability to say, OK, Google, and do voice-activated search. A lot of Google Now integration into search, and a lot of great things with Google Maps. You'll want to check out at maps.google.com slash preview. Of course, they finished up with Larry Page giving... Well, what a lot of people right at the moment were considering a very moving speech, uh, you know, Larry fighting with vocal issues because of uh, partial vocal cord paralysis and and kind of setting out his his definition of what the world should look like. And in questions afterwards, a couple times indicating he, he'd like a country for developers to be able to go and and 
try stuff out, uh, almost as if you were setting up an independent nation for, for beta testing <laughs> things in society. So really interesting stuff, if if a little lengthy, uh, from Google today. Big thanks to our, our uh, Slingbox sponsorship. Without Slingbox, you couldn't get the breaking news on Twit. So slingbox.com slash Twit, thanks to them. Watch your TV at home. Just hook it up to your TV, hook it up to your internet. You can watch it on your, your phone. You can watch it on your tablet. Check it out at Best Buy, uh, Amazon, or slingbox.com slash twit. That is it for our coverage of Google I.O. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to Aaron Newcomb, Sarah Lane, and Ayaz Akhtar. Thanks to Leo Laporte, Gina Trapani, and Jeff Jarvis for being in the chat room. And thank you most of all for watching. We'll see you next time.